morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Brenda Leong, Senior Counsel and Director of AI and Ethics at the Future of Privacy Forum. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this event in partnership with AARP, Adding Age to AI, the Representation of Older Adults in Digital Products and Services. We have a tremendous lineup of speakers and we look forward to a very productive event. Just a heads up at the beginning, this event will be recorded and available afterwards for viewing for those who couldn't join us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Christina on behalf of AARP to welcome you. Thank you, Brenda. Welcome everyone. I'm really happy to be here with the Future of Privacy Forum to host this event. My name is Christina Fitzpatrick and I'm a Policy Development Director at AARP. AARP is the nation's leading organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. I wanna unpack that, that mission statement a bit because it's important for today's conversation. We represent people 50 and older, so it's a wide age, age range. That means that we care deeply about issues like nursing home safety and quality. But when we talk about older adults and aging, we're also committed to vibrant neighbor, neighborhoods, fair marketplaces, access to financial services, and quality affordable health insurance, among other issues. And that's why today you're gonna to hear about a range of topics. Another fundamental concern of AARP is age discrimination. Over the past year, we have been investigating how AI and machine learning affect older adults, particularly when it comes to bias. What we found is that the needs and experiences of older adults have largely been left out of the conversation that needs to change. The same factors that result in bias against other groups that have historically faced discrimination likely play a role when it comes to age. Data sets that don't include them, developers who don't reflect them, and societal biases that are embedded. This project with the Future of Privacy Forum takes some important steps on the journey of uplifting the topic of aging and AI. It examines the research around the digital technologies that are most relevant to older adults. It explores whether the design and execution of these products and services consider the needs of older adults. And it will study whether we have the data we need to train algorithms appropriately. FPF will summarize the findings of this research in a report to be released later this year. It will be a valuable resource for documenting the issues and identifying solutions. I want to extend my deep appreciation to Brenda Leong and Sarah Jordan from FPF for their commitment to this project and for all the work they have done so far. And thanks to Nicole Sanchez for running today's event. To improve how technology works for older adults, we need to understand where we are and where we need to go. Today's speakers will do just that. Thank you. And Brenda, turning it over to you. Thanks very much, Christina. Um, we are very excited to have been able to partner with AAIP for this project and uh, believe that it will yield some very useful information in terms of recognizing where technology and research is now, um, what some of the key challenges are and what we can expect in the future uh, as this demographic changes over time and additional work is done in this area. Um, <clears throat> targeting technology and products and services to these uh, various cohorts. So I'd like to begin by introducing our first panel, which is on the health and physiological needs of seniors as targeted by elder specific technology. And this panel is mostly uh, to discuss sort of the policy and social impacts of some of these services <clears throat> to set the stage for the technical discussion to follow. Um, first, I'd like to uh, introduce Anjun Namkun, who is the Virtual Services Coordinator and Workforce Development Center in Alexandria, Virginia. She's going to discuss older adult representation in digital government services. Anju is a professional communicator specializing in digital media, knowledge management systems, and remote project management. She has experience in nonprofit schools and universities, technology companies, and public policy organizations. Also with us on this panel is Pamela Teaster, Professor and Director for the Center of Gerontology at Virginia Tech. And she's gonna 
talk primarily about systems to control finances for cognitively impaired older adults, as well as some other points uh, from her experience. Um, TSTAR has a long history of serving the public interest in ensuring that older Americans receive protection from exploitation and abuse by those in positions of power or trust. Her ongoing research focuses on the mistreatment of elders and vulnerable adults, public and private guardianship, end of life issues, and decision making, ethical treatment, and human rights issues for vulnerable adults in public affairs and public policy. She's the author and editor of four books and is also a board member on a number of organizations around gerontology and related topics and has extensive experience leading ed education and technical research and services for this community. Jim Steele, our next panelist, is a writer for Iron Company and Starting Strength Physical Training System and will be addressing the available data on older persons and fitness. As a writer and podcaster for Iron Company and a writer for Starting Strength, 30 years of college strength and conditioning coach and the owner of Bars, bazbarbell.com. Jim has been immersed in athletics and the Iron Game for most of his life. He has been a college football player and coach, power lifter, uh, Muay Thai fighter, sorry if I mispronounced that, and is currently a competitive bodybuilder. In 1999, Steele was named assistant strength and conditioning coordinator at the University of Pennsylvania and served as head strength and conditioning coordinator in 2004. He is a motivational speaker, frequent podcast guest, and author of two books. Finally, on this panel, we have Lee Postkanzer, who is the CEO of Directive Communication Services, Inc., and uh, a startup that is designed to assist with the records of digital property, online accounts, and final directives for people uh, doing their estate planning. Lee leads a technology company delivering digital assets in the property succession succession management solutions for all stakeholders involved around an individual's death. Recognizing the growing need for effectively managing digital property succession management, DCS works with professional advisors, individual clients, and content providers with the planning and administration of an individual's digital holdings. Lee is an established and respected authority on the digital afterlife and has appeared in several articles and features for leading press and has won several awards, including National Law Journal's Trailblazer Award, CNBC.com, CNET, Insurance News, and Trust in the States Magazine. At the end of each panel, we will open this up for questions. You can post those in the Q&A tab as we go along. So please feel free to post and we'll curate and combine them for the discussion to follow. I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, Pam, Pamela Teaster to kick us off for the first panel. Pam, I think you're muted. <laughs> How about thank you so much again. Um, thank you very so much for having me. And I'm so pleased to be with such a fabulous group of people to present on a variety of wonderful topics. Um, so, and and so Anju, I want to say hi to you just formally because I get, I've worked with her and Jim, I want you to know, I work with power block weights every morning. Very I'm good. I'm up to 35 pounds cross, cross, cross um, uh, and I, I'm on, a, I'm on a, a flat or raised platform to do so. And, and really, I've done it since COVID. It has changed my life, and it wow. really has. Um, so I wish I had you as a trainer, but I also have an Amazon who is. So um, anyway, thank you all. I've done a lot of work um, related to vulnerable and vulnerable younger and older adults. And so this is a, this is both, both a, uh, this is a double-edged sword um, when we think about um, systems to control finances for persons with cognitive impairments. Um, I'll show you a bit of, a, a little bit of slide um, in just a moment, but I wanted to bring up some points about older people just to get you on the page. So, um, so a New York study by Mark Lex, Carl Pilmer, all the great people who do a lot of wonderful work in, in elder abuse, um, found that for every known report of elder abuse that's reported to authorities, 24 go unreported. Um, one in, uh, one in 13 people will be abused at some point this year, and that could be abuse, neglect, or exploitation, or all of them. Um, uh, there are 50% uh, of people over age 85 who have dementia. There are 15 to 20% of people age 65 plus, which is getting closer and closer to my age all the time, um, who have mild cognitive impairment. Um, 
So um, I just kind of wanted to, things that cause people to get into abusive situations or risk factors are one, cognitive impairment, two, social isolation. Um, and who are the biggest centers of mistreatment, particularly exploitation, but also abuse and neglect? Family. Um, so the very people who might be taking care of you are the very people who might harm you. What we have learned is if you live with somebody other than your partner in a good relationship, the more family members you have around, the more likely that it could be that you would be exploited. Um, but again, low social support, uh, a feeling isolation is sort of a hallmark of these issues as it is for other kinds of abuse. And have we not been living in that kind of environment it, as well as one of just plain flat out fear for people's lives. So with that sunny opening, um, let me uh, move now to um, share my screen for just a little bit about this, this piece. So let me do that. And um, so there I am. Um, and let me move to screen slides. So I have that, hang on a sec. And let's progress forward. So considerations for AI and co people with cognitive impairment. What I wanted you to understand was that Cognitive impairment is cognitive impairment. Some people have more or fewer impairments, but it is certainly not a black and white uh, concept. And so I just want to point out um, financial exploitation is probably the one we hear the most about because older adults will report. How many people with dementia are financially exploited? Much harder thing to try to um, understand because the reporting mechanisms are different. So we don't get a picture of that. What we do know, it's all underreported. So what are considerations when we think about using AI to protect people? And there's the word protect. So, um, so we think about safety, but that could also be paternalism, could it not? We think about online transactions, and a number of us have probably uh, been spooked or had our, I know people who've had their whole identities taken away and I've worked with them before. Um, so all those sorts of things. So what protections are in place? Um, what about privacy? And what about privacy for people with cognitive impairment? Don't they deserve it? They certainly do. And what about justice issues? Uh, I have another colleague, from, a couple of colleagues from Virginia Tech. We live in a more rural area and we know there's not a lot of bandwidth everywhere. And so is that just to people just because of the basis of where they live or their age? And I know this group is going to explore that. I thought I would give you a whirlwind tour of some of the um, some of the services that are in the space of AI to protect individuals. So first there's a lot, and I just give you the site, the, the um, sites for this. Um, this is not all of them. I'm sure more have entered than when I did a look-see to see what I could find. There is LifeSite, which is a virtual safety deposit box um, designed for designated family. Ah, um, and it's a payment scheduler and a reminder and it's a subscription service. It's all about monitoring. And I took a little screenshot of what you might look at when you see that. Silver Bills is another one. And they all like to say that they are endorsed by somebody such as AARP, for example, or they, the AARP knows about them. Silver Bills is a, is a payment scheduler. It does electronic transactions. It audits invoices. Um, it is a fa family group can look over it. Um, you can see that they're all fairly recent. It too is a for subscription service and it has regular life fees um, that are associated. I couldn't do, be, uh, dive too deep because I don't want them to write me. Um, Eversafe um, is another one of the, um, of the uh, AI services in the space. Um, they analyze transaction histories and credit electronically and they look for suspicious or out of ordinary transactions. I have a little more inside baseball knowledge of them because I know one of the founders of it. Um, and I know that they are working with the courts to try to see if this can be useful for people who are involved in guardianship. Um, again, it's a sub business model that's on, based on a subscription and it produces alerts when things don't look quite right for a designated reviewer and family member. TrueLink, another one. This is a reloadable Visa card, but the reason I would put it on here is because it, it um, has special protections for anti-fraud constraints, something like your MasterCard, but maybe on, uh, on, uh, in hyper mode. Um, then another, with a little harder to find, Onist. Um, it is somewhat specific for clients, but again, the same thing, access to designated family members and advisors about account monitoring 
um, but a higher fee for that. Would, again, it was a little bit harder to get a, a pretty picture, but monitoring accounts and um, based on an issue of trust. Um, and then Golden, you can see the AARP winner there. Um, it's a mobile app for accessing accounts, has some fraud perfection, um, AI budget trend analysis. It too is a subscription and it is also a um, monitoring of accounts. And we see sort of here the daughter, um, we assume is the daughter, and then a person who maybe looks like he or she can't necessarily manage to monitor an account. So the questions here, and, and I know my time is limited, but I sort of open you up to other issues. There's, a, there's peril and promise. Um, and so uh, it can be that um, these are keep people safe, but it also could be that they're somewhat ageist and paternalistic. When, who gets to decide who gets those accounts? Uh, when do we decide that a person with mild cognitive impairment might have moved away from the ability to, trans, to monitor transactions? Anyway, that's um, probably my time, I think, to give you sort of a beginning. But the issues of safety is all about beneficence, um, but could be paternalistic necessarily and could be ageist necessarily. All people don't need to have their finances monitored by their children, and they shouldn't. All right. So anyway, thank you very much for letting me be the kickoff for um, this um, nice panel this morning. I am sure that we'll move on to other things. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Pam. That was very informative and I already have a lot of questions. So I know we're gonna have an interesting discussion later. Um, Yanju, if you are ready, we will um, go to you next and hear about your experiences. Hello, good morning. Um, I'm Anju Namkung and I also want to say it's a privilege to be on a panel with pa um, Dr. Teaster. She said we work together, but really I was her mentee and student. So um, I'm so it's, a, it's an honor to be speaking alongside her, as well as these other great um, panelists. Uh, so I'm here to represent uh, the City of Alexandria's Workforce Development Center. Um, even my position at the Workforce Development Center is a symptom of what happened uh, due to COVID. Um, I'm, I really want to bring a public administration perspective and the um, and discuss with you all sort of the implications that are involved, the implications that are triggered now we, that, that we are in a remote environment. Um, I started last summer as a virtual services coordinator because the Workforce Development Center, which delivers unemployment and employment services, were unable to meet their customers um, because, their, um, because their staff did not have the capacity to reach um, their customers remotely. Traditionally, these customers would, and sorry, when I say customers, these are the residents of the city of Alexandria. Uh, they refer to them as customers. So the customers um, would, co would come on site, but without the ability to meet on site, uh, the Workforce Development Center was in a position where the staff had to quickly scale up to um, even handle their communications remotely and then eventually be able to transition their services to go online. And among the customers, one of the biggest contingencies we serve is the 50 plus community. So I'm going to transition, I'm going to transition to some slides to give you some visual aids of the new programs that we had developed, or at least a new campaign we developed to help um, reframe how we are approaching delivering our services. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so traditionally the Workforce Development Center offers employment and unemployment services, as I mentioned, and this was all done in person. But because um, we weren't able to do that, we had to retool everything as a under a banner of Strive and Thrive. Uh, I think we were not only um, among the staff, we there was a real need to um, bring up the morale and also um, we needed to signal as an organization that's serving the community how much we are changing and adapting to this new environment. And so we developed a campaign called Strive and Thrive, um, which, uh, which was to rally a cry for how Alexandrians are stay, staying resilient and also getting back to work. As part of this, the staff really had to learn quick how to start to even market rem uh, rem digitally. And um, this is an example, a screenshot of a uh, video that had that was commissioned in order to start to advertise how we were transitioning our services to go online. 
Um, among the different services that we went, were able to pivot to go online were virtual hiring events, one-on-one -on -one virtual job coaching, and career readiness workshops that were held virtually. Um, we also partnered with AARP Virginia to hold, host webinars, and these were specifically targeted for 50 plus audiences. And we'll go into the content of what those webinars were um, because I think it has particular interest to this um, audience here. And uh, another program that we specially developed um, to provide extra, extra white glove service to our 50 plus were, um, was the rapid reskilling cohort where um, there was, a, there was a big need for community among our 50 plus customers, especially because we didn't have any on-site locations. Uh, we weren't able to convene them and um, we couldn't develop, we, we realized there is a need for developing a cadence to uh, work more closely with them and more regularly. And so cohorts were designed so that um, these 50 plus residents weren't just dropping in for a workshop here, a workshop there, but they would be able to join a um, systematic, uh, sorry, systematic is not the right word, but um, they would be able to join a organized program that would run for two, three months at a time. So I'm saying all these now, I'm listing all these services off now, but it really was a struggle. It took about a month of preparation um, to pivot these services to go online. It had a lot of implications for getting, this is a local government environment I'm talking about. So we had, there were, there were a lot of um, there were a lot of meetings that had to get done uh, with IT, with other stakeholders to be able to get our software even approved. Um, and I'm really trying to draw attention to this because I think public administration environments um, or these public environments often are um, a little bit, they're not quick to change, oh, sorry, they're not quick to adapt to new technologies. And this may actually sort of be a very big bottleneck for um, being able to deliver Access, access to government programs online, um, even getting Zoom approved, even getting um, different survey tools, if sign up tools, um, registration tools. We rely so much on software now to conduct marketing, to conduct any workflow processes, to conduct the actual connection and communications itself. Um, so, uh, for me as a virtual services coordinator, that was one of the biggest things I had to do, just simply liaise across departments to be able to convince everyone we need this and this is secure and this is what it can unlock in terms of reaching people. Um, and, and so we'll return to that in a moment. So even with the AARP webinar contents, we really had to um, pivot the content as well to help our older adults adapt to um, this remote world. So seeking employment in this remote world has implications for the application process, which is all conducted online. Um, also, there was, we were, we were putting more stress on the value of transferable skills in this environment. Um, if you can't, if you can't replicate the work space exactly, how do you reframe what skills you have for things you can do remotely? And also just simply helping people have the capacity to set up work environments so that they can work remotely. Um, so the Workforce Development Center specifically works with our older adults for employment. Um, but I wanted to just mention that we have the privilege of having so, such a vibrant and healthy um, ecosystem of other stakeholders who are advocating for old, older adults. The Commission on Aging for the Alex City of Alexandria is very proactive and we are lucky to have them because even without, they are, they are the organization that is able to hold all departments accountable for aging implications. And I think just public administration structure wise, uh, a strong and proactive commission is a valuable tool. And we, um, I, although I don't work with the Area Agency on Aging, which is on the Division of Aging and Adult Services for Alexandria, I did want to mention a few of the, the, the services they um, rolled out last year. Um, they, um, the, the Area Agency on Aging, um, they had two senior centers and one daycare, uh, day, day, adult day services center, um, but unfortunately it was closed due to COVID. And so uh, with CARES funding, they were able to secure about 40 of these grand pads and the, these grand pads were distributed to help um, residents be able to um, 
conduct work online, uh, as well as just make connections online, they really identified that loneliness uh, and isolation was a very um, pressing problem and challenge to overcome. And so um, they found a lot of success distributing grand pads with this federal funding. Here's another shot of this um, device. This device has cellular, cellular um, consumer cellular on it. So even a lot of the households that did not have Wi-Fi would, so the, these devices were specifically distributed to those houses that did not have Wi-Fi. You, um, the city of Alexandria is actually trying to distribute a Amazon fires as well. Unfortunately, the Amazon Fire requires, uh, Amazon Fires also is a tablet device and it can provide people internet connection, but you need Wi-Fi in order to be able to use it. And so the city of Alexandria actually has a stockpile of Alexandria fire, Fires, but the, um, the residents who would qualify for, their pro for this benefit, unfortunately don't even have Wi-Fi in their homes to be able to take the fire. So they've been more relying on grand pads than even fires. So I'm just going to wrap up to say um, we really need to improve the tolerance and the process around technology adoption within public organizations because it has huge, huge implications for how we can reach our residents. Um, I know we're talking about older adults at large in terms of their representation in data sets, but um, we are like the city governments, state governments are specifically working or serving the most vulnerable. And as I was mentioning with the Wi-Fi situation, oftentimes it's very difficult to even reach them and know about them. And uh, right now, even with the most vulnerable citizens, we are only doing phone calls as opposed to even being able to email with them. Um, yeah, and um, just conferring with the Area Agency on Aging, we did, we, we, Generally, as a city, we're, our biggest challenge is to consistently try and find those who need a benefit. We have so many things to distribute, but even finding these older adults is uh, proves to be very difficult. Overall, though, um, having come in as a virtual services coordinator since last year, uh, I have been impressed by the ability for many of all of us right, to adapt to um, communicating remotely, to be able to um, introduce new work processes into our lives. So I do have hope, yeah. And uh, thank you, that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much, MG, that was great. A lot to think about there and, and um, really appreciate that very specific discussion of, of one municipality's approach to this and how things are working, which hopefully we can then um, use as a baseline and consider other places and their experiences as well. Um, Let's now move to uh, Jim Steele to talk to us about older adults and fitness. I want to I want to get my two cents in quickly that yes, I do work out with a strength trainer and and uh, do do all I can to stay in shape as those years approach. So uh, yeah. everybody feels the right. need to tell me that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all intimidated. We all want to make nah. sure that, that we're doing what we need to do. But um, please take it away, Jim. You no, know, I appreciate y'all having me. Uh, really honored to be here. So. What the data shows um, about 50, 50 years and older uh, adults is sort of what I suspected that, and I focus more on resist, the resistance training aspect of it, not so much the cardiovascular or aerobic aspect of it. Um, that resistance training is a key um, at any age, you know, uh, past your teenage years, but as you get older, it's even more important because it strengthens your bones, it strengthens your tendons, it strengthens your muscles. It enables you to do things, um, I like to call life skills uh, more effectively, okay? Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. So you can see I couldn't figure out how to do the background. So this is my, my little office here. Um, so a little background on myself. So for 30 years, I was a collegiate strength coach um, and that's kids from 18 to 22, basically. Um, but about 10 years ago, uh, I was approached uh, about training a rowing team. So this is, um, I would say 75%, 80% of them were over 50. Now, uh, it's called dragon boating, which it, the boat actually looks like a dragon, if you can believe that. So uh, it's pretty interesting. But I was a little wary, you know, I had never trained anybody. I mean, I think the oldest person I had trained, you know, was probably about 25 um, when I was offered to do this. And so, 
I, you know, I didn't know what, really what to do. So I did some research and all that. And then, you know, basically what I found was the, the older adults can use the same type of exercises that the, that the young athletes that I was training, um, you know, four days a week and all that were doing, but they needed a couple things. They needed some adjustments made. Okay. So when I say the same kind of exercises, um, I'm going back to the mimicking of life, right? So picking things up off of the ground, right? That's the deadlift. That's, and so that I'm, I focus a lot on free weights, which is a barbell with plates on it, with, you know, iron on it, but this can be done with any type of weights. The important thing is you need that pressure. You need that resistance. Okay. Um, so the deadlift, which is picking stuff off of the ground, because think about in life, right? Um, I, I will tell you this as an aside that I always told all my, all my rowers, my 50, 50 year old, uh, rowers and up, I don't want you to ever have to ask for help for anything. You should be self-sufficient. And this is what's going to really uh, enable you to, to go down that path where you don't have to say, Hey, I need help with the groceries. Hey, I need help putting this on the shelf. You know, uh, one of my favorite stories, I'm going to get off on a tangent here, but, um, I think was a lady named Rena. I trained she's about four eleven, ninety 90 pounds. Okay. Um, and she had never lifted weights before. And when she first uh, got there, I think she was deadlifting. The deadlift is the bar with the plates on it, lifting it up off the ground, probably around, you know, maybe 80 pounds, which is pretty good. By the time she left, I think she was doing like 165 pounds or something like that. And what she told me was that it changed her life because now she could do things that she was able to do 15, 20 years ago, right? And now she regained that 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 strength so that was that was that was fun and that that's rewarding when that happens so um so what i found was that they that the life mimicking exercises that we could do the deadlift squatting down um there's a lot of research that shows that um you know senior adults just with putting a weight on their back like even if it's just a bar with barely any weight improves that bone density okay so i did axial loading which is what it means when a bar is on your back but that doesn't have to happen. What you really need is, you know, cause there's a lot of people that won't be able to do that because of low back issues and things like that. What you really need is just that pressure and just those life mimicking skills of the squatting motion, whether it's squats where you're just holding on to something very light or whether you're just sitting down in a chair and standing up again, okay? And then eventually adding some resistance. It, you, you do have to add some resistance um, and it doesn't have to be much, but, and it could be, um, body weight resistance and things like that meaning you can add more repetitions or do more sets and things like that it just have to have incremental increases that was one of the differences that i found uh, training older folks versus training younger folks was you really have to just go incrementally so if i so let's say rena you know can lift 100 pounds uh, I would start her off in a percentage of that 100 pounds, and it would be a very low percentage. Whereas when I'm training a football team or you know women's lacrosse team, they can start at a higher percentage. Okay, so you know you would do 60% of that one rep max for some sets and repetitions. The next week, 65. So where I would make 10 pound 10% jumps with a old with a younger crowd, with an older crowd, it would be more you know smaller jumps, 5% or maybe even less. Uh, and sometimes you go down and then you come back up again, but. Uh, so uh, that was a huge uh, uh, one thing I discovered was the frequency. So, you know, this team only lifted with me, the 50 years and, and up, only lifted with me once a week. And they made crazy gains in strength and muscle tone also. Uh, so it can be done. So I was a little wary about them going off on their own without me, you know, supervising them. Because the biggest thing is you, there's so many great exercises, but the, um, you know, the downside, if you get hurt, then you got to start all over again. And it's, it's a really, you just have to have the correct form. You know, you really have to have somebody to teach them and know, that know what they're doing. So I would encourage them when they were away from me, <laughs> when I wasn't watching them, uh, to do some body weight stuff, your push-ups, uh, running, walking, you know, fast walking, things like that, and then do the weight training with me. And it would, really was crazy. So where the football team, I could train four days a week with heavyweights, the women's lacrosse team, same way, the women's soccer team, men's soccer. Then they'd go out and run, right? Um, with this group, I, I found that if I just train them hard once a week, it's about a 45-minute workout, that they could get stronger and then they could recover, okay? So then, uh, and then just do that lighter stuff um, on their own. So um, as far as the cardiovascular component of it that I, that I did with them, which was, 
um, basically a warm up in the beginning where we would get 15, 20 yards and go down and on a track and do little leg swings and things like that. You know, my father was a, a professor at the University of Maryland for 40 years and he taught motor learning. So he always told me one of the skills you lose first uh, as you age is going backwards. Just think about it. How many times do you have to run backwards in life? Now, when you're a kid, you're running backwards all the time, you know? So I always included that in the warm up, uh, and the improvement was crazy just over a few weeks. Um, the first time everybody runs backwards when you haven't done it in a while, they're almost falling down and looking back, you know? So, uh, and then I would see the incremental changes where they would get better at that. So um, I think that's important. And, you know, I just think getting started and doing something where the resistance is involved, um, whether it's just dumbbells in your in your house, a kettlebell, bands, any any type of resistance. The research is pretty definitive that the there has to be some type of resistance. And in my anecdotal uh, you know experience with hundreds and hundreds of these dragon boat ladies, um, you know you have to. It doesn't have to be crazy, but it has to be some kind of pressure in uh, you know concerning the weights and resistance. Okay, I hope I didn't go off on too many tangents there, but that's sort of what I got. Sorry, I unmuted and muted myself all in a second there. Um, that is great. No, really helpful and informative. Thank you very great. much. Um, and let and then we're going to wrap up this first panel by hearing from Lee about his experiences in considering the end of life planning that has not traditionally had as much focus or emphasis. So for obvious reasons, uh, as people now are dealing with digital properties or digital accounts and services and how those can be accessed, closed, transitioned, or otherwise responsibly managed in, in estate planning processes. So Lee, I turn it over to you. Thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking me to participate. Uh, I'm gonna get started by jumping right into sharing my uh, screen, and I think I need to have the ability to share the screen. Uh, it says it's, uh, I'm unable- One second, Lee. We'll get you that uh, permission real quick. If you want to um, sure. go ahead and start, we'll get that teed up in just a second. Sure. So I'm going to talk, oh, here we go. I've got it. Excellent. I hope everybody can see the screen. Looks good, thanks. No worries, excellent. Uh, I'm going to be discussing a little bit of a big problem and it's a growing problem. Uh, most of us have been dealing with technology in terms of our daily lives. We're, we're living and eating, breathing with technology, online accounts, digital assets, but it's finally collided with the, the world of trust and estates. And it's creating right now what we estimate to be about a $7 trillion problem uh, between investments and online assets, as well as uh, looking at uh, personal memories and other aspects that we might consider sentimental value. But before we talk a little bit about uh, digital assets and deaths, we have to define what a digital asset is. And a digital asset means it's an electronic record in which an individual has a right or an interest. And that some have boiled it down to being a digital record is a digital asset. And everything that we do online is creating a digital footprint, which leads to a digital asset. So we literally have millions of data points out there. And for the world of trust and estates, these simple downloads of apps or enrolling in new accounts have resulted in significant and very problematic issues with regards to transference. I'm just gonna to touch upon a few of these and these are real stories. Uh, a young a girl, age six, lost her dad and her mother wanted her to know her through pictures and videos that were uh, stored on the iPhone and up in the iCloud. And Apple, because of privacy laws, wouldn't release the contents. It was a three and a half year court battle where the family had to hire a privacy attorney. And then the, the, the uh, pictures had to be vetted by that privacy attorney before they could be passed on to the family. So you can imagine the frustration, the emotion, the lost legacy that follows, just simply accessing pictures that were once easily stored in a box and, and people would just go through. Uh, we have situations that 
uh, with online businesses such as e-commerce sites or Instagram influencers that due to expiration dates or privacy policies or data deletion policies that if estates don't get to them in time and because terms of service agreements in many cases are signed by individuals never being passed on to the organization, the contents of those host providers or those domain names cannot necessarily be passed on to the business. And we just saw here in Toronto, where I, I live now, uh, a marketing firm that went through that and we're looking at seven million dollars, I'm sorry, seven figures to try to recreate contents and recreate domain names uh, simply because there was no succession plan in place for the individual who was running the technology for those online businesses. Uh, we're looking at RBC Bank, very large bank that uh, several years ago had to deal with an iPhone and at, they, they appealed to Apple providing all different proof points, but they could not show the account holder's intent to distribute the apps and the contents of the phone and they were denied. And then they tried to hand the phone to the family to figure out the password. And then they were told they were permanently locked out because clearly if they had the phone owner and the account holder for the iCloud uh, storage had intended for them to be passed on, they would have made that declaration, but you're trying to use the passwords. And then many feel like a password manager is a great way to go. The issue again is passwords are not very good. And you'll hear me say that several times throughout this discussion they can lead to bigger problems and permanent lockout. Password manager's job ends when a person dies. They can no longer act as an agent. And if somebody is to enter the account, uh, impersonating the account holder by logging in and using the credentials, it is a violation of laws. It can talk to, it can create problems for the family as I think it was Pam Teamster mentioned that some of the ones that abuse us most are the ones that are closest to us. Well, if we give them the, the keys to the car and they can spend 10, 20, $30,000 with credentials and logins for Amazon, well, Amazon can say the estate owes that because the passwords were passed on and that person violated the, uh, the terms of service agreements. We're looking at losing a lot and everybody's at risk. There's nobody spared here. So we have for individuals, they can potentially lose their estate value their legacy, we see that time and time again, and it's absolutely horrible when people don't have access to information. We can lose income that's gonna be generated through e-commerce businesses or other digital activities. We have the risk of personal privacy being distributed out. Uh, that can happen both because people were able to impersonate account holders and then have accidents happen and information gets out or even uneducated content providers not following the law or their own policies. For advisors, such as lawyers, they have real risks and liabilities. Many of them are just getting up to speed on digital assets and they're trying to make decisions or provide recommendations that are not necessarily effective in making sure contents are accessible. Uh, they also have to worry about their reputation. They're, they tend to be adverse to technology because it can bring damage to their reputation and they can fail to meet the objectives of the clients and the goals of the estate. Content providers too. We think of innovators as always doing things and changing things, but one thing they haven't really focused in on is what happens when an account holder passes away. They have to protect the privacy of that data and they're held accountable by federal and state laws also international jurisdictional laws because not every website or app that we uh, enroll in is based in the United States. So we have to look at international jurisdictions as well. We have, they have to comply to their own terms of service agreements. Many of them also don't have the capacity to handle online death, uh, account holders death. And so they're running and scrambling trying to make sure that they are able to provide the data when necessary. Also, they may have inaccessibility to their own data, uh, particularly password managers and crypto companies. Uh, many times that's deeply encrypted that they can't de-encrypt for an estate, even if they wanted to. So everybody's at risk here. Uh, we're doing a lot more in an internet minute. 
Uh, just to give you an idea, in one minute, back in 2020, we spent um, sent almost 200 emails. Many of them have attachments that could be financial statements. They could be pictures and videos. They can be uh, important documents, appraisals, government documents. So we're doing a lot more online and we're trusting digital activities to uh, carry out what we ask them to. The average person today has over 200 accounts in all different areas. It can be email, cloud-based storage, DNA heritage discovery, social media, registrations. We're doing so much more online and even Zoom has exploded since COVID. And seniors are doing much more with technology and you know, online investing. They're not far behind their younger peers. So people are becoming more acclimated to doing everything from investing and research, et cetera. We look at seniors. I, I cannot tell you the number of lawyers that will look at seniors and say, you know, my, my clients don't really have much in the way of digital assets. But then when they ask them, they discover they can have 80 or 90 accounts when they think about the utilities and the vacation homes and things that need to be dealt with. Even something as simple as music. YouTube, the music usage by those over age 55 is growing while in other categories, it's declining. That tells me that elderly uh, and seniors are looking more for resources and entertainment. And lastly, the, the way that seniors are using their smartphones has changed. This is a study by Erickson. And we can see that they've gone away from daily usage of smartphones for particular uh, 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 entertainment or instant messaging to making it a weekly or even a monthly uh, experience. Why is all of this being disrupted? Well, unlike physical property, digital property has inherent traits such as privacy elements that are governed by federal and state law and those terms of service agreements. They're very powerful, and that is what guides the custodians or the content providers. We have a number of popular misconceptions, such as I can share my password. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. If the two-factor authentication kicks in and the user doesn't, doesn't discover it or doesn't uh, know the answers, all of a sudden to the content provider, it looks like hacking. And there's been an instance where authorities were sent to a decedent's family's home uh, because they were trying so hard to get into an account, an email account, and it appears hacking. So they were just trying to discover whether it was a hacking issue. We haven't touched upon digital, act, uh, digital property attributes. We bury our files in folder names seven or eight layers deep, and then we expect our fiduciaries to be able to find everything. We've created secure, our own personal security techniques, and we don't necessarily expect those who are gonna be successors or those who have been tasked with discovering uh, the different files and folders that they're gonna to have to play detective. They're gonna be Sherlock Holmes. We also have to worry about expiration dates and inactivity dates. It's not, not it, they don't generate from the time of death. They begin when the clock starts on the content provider's calendar uh, uh, schedule. New asset types coming along, we have to think about, this is again where AI will be very helpful because right now, for example, holographic images are going from being mostly research or informational to in the home soon where I'll be able to record myself and my great, great grandkids will be able to have a video holographic image of me in the room where they can ask me questions. And it's like, we're having a conversation. So we have new asset types to worry about. And then fluctuating market value, going back to some of the financial, only a year ago, Bitcoin was worth $5,000 and if, anybody had made an investment in that, it's now worth over $70,000. You made a heck of a return on investment. I know I didn't and I missed out on that. Uh, I'm just gonna go through the next few slides very quickly. These are some of the terms of service that dictate the rules on which digital assets and online accounts are, are governed by, uh, and they remain in force. They're, uh, they're highly complied to. These are just some of the issues regarding password sharing. Uh, certainly uh, the slides will be available so you can take a deeper look at this. And then there are four elements as we look about 
uh, when you're considering digital assets and online accounts for your estate. One is transparency. You have to know the account exists. Two, you have to have the accessibility. When I say accessibility, I mean according to the terms of the law and the site owner's terms of service, which means you have to tie the account holder ID to the account holder, to the decedent, and what their intent was for the release of that contents of information. You have to do it in a timely manner because you have expiration dates and in a, uh, data auto deletion policies with, uh, that are, are trig, uh, following right behind that you have to be aware of. And then there's a lot of information. So you also have to have the ability or the, the person given the tasks of researching information and distribution have to have the ability to carry out all this information in a timely manner. Um, just real quickly, two types of disclosures. One is the disclosure of the account contents, which means information is going to be distributed, pictures, videos, data in Dropbox. They're going to be distributed for someone to go through or share. Then there's the action-oriented directive, the deletion, closure of the account, removal of the name, transfer, some cases memorialization. And then lastly, I'll finish up with this. Where we look to go, we want to make sure that we're triangulating what we actually do versus what we say and what we think we'll do, because in the world of trust and estates, every one of those points has a very different impact on the success of your estate settlement. And I know I'm way over time, so I'm not going to continue and I will end there. Thanks very much, Lee, and no problem. This is all such good information from all of these panelists. Um, all of them had things to be impressed by and concerned by, and Lee, yours was both informative and a little bit terrifying. Um, I certainly don't mean to be either disrespectful or morbid, but I really don't know that I want a parent holographically watching me from the corner of my room into the future to, to be able to ask questions to, no matter how reassuring that might be in some ways. Um, to answer a general question that was posted, we will be sharing the slides in the follow-up to the event, and we will be providing a, a summarized report um, with notes and overview of what uh, took place today, and that will be sent to all attendees. So yes, we will be getting all that information to you afterwards. Um, to start with a general question that's sort of aimed at everyone, um, each of you alluded to this at least to some degree or another, but I'd like to sort of pinpoint your thoughts on what do you see as sort of the key missing element about how technology is being used to address the needs and priorities of older adults, either within your specific area of expertise or more generally, um, what, what isn't being done that you've sort of seen the lack of or wish you'd had the ability to do or have access to or that someone else was doing? Um, Pam, I'm gonna start with you. Um, I think when I, you know, I don't know that the construction of all of these um, AI platforms to monitor um, finances, but the presumption is always about safety, right? And yet, I think probably the issue is um, in privacy. The issue is the older adult with mild cognitive impairment or cognitive impairment may not really want those kids to get into that stuff. And I think the issue is how how did the older were the older people consulted about this one or or not? I don't know the answer for how they have done. Some of them are, but some of them aren't. Some of them are, you know, the capability drives the product, but it doesn't really involve how older adults feel about this. Um, I have a great follow-up to that, but I want to stick with stick with the question and, and get other folks' thought as well. Um, I'll jump to the end. Lee, what do you see in the, uh, obviously there's a lot of things you see missing in sort of the legal landscape and the general awareness, but, but is there a particular thing that you think is one of the key things moving forward? I, de I definitely think awareness is critical because I think people make assumptions on what digital property is and how it's handled. I think the biggest aspect is that people confuse it as being similar to physical property. Oh, I'll just give it and it'll be fine. They don't realize that the privacy laws and, the, and their terms of service actually govern uh, what is to be done. I mean, recent, there was research a few years ago by a uh, University of Connecticut where they created a fake social media site. And if you signed the terms of service and agreed to using this social media site, you gave up rights to your firstborn. Well, less than a, you know, only a small fraction of the respondents actually caught that. Otherwise we'd have a very big adoption agency just waiting to happen. 
but there, it's really the awareness. And I think many of the things that I think about are the same things Pamela thinks about is people need to think about their privacy. Do they want their children who may be their fiduciary uh, handling the state, but should they really be getting access to the emails that may actually have correspondence with someone they're cheating, their parents who are cheating on their spouse with? That can be very disruptive. Um, and it can be very emotional and it can actually change the way an estate settled. So I think we have to think about what do we want to share with people and that we have to take it seriously. Great. Um, Anju, what are your thoughts, um, particularly as a like practical provider of services in, in your position? Right. I think, um, I think it's the capacity. This is not so much the, the, the user behavior of older adults themselves that may generate data, but more so how, um, how public organizations can build their capacity to be able to interpret data sources and just have greater literacy around how they themselves um, are able to pool um, information that is available to them. And I think it requires a little bit of creativity, certainly a lot of technical facility um, from federally provided sites to those that are provided by ARP's PPI to those that they have sitting on hand, even a registration list that they may have, like being able to just have a better understanding of how to interpret uh, what they have available to them, I think would uh, really benefit public administration and um, be able to then enhance the visibility of the residents who need the services. And Jim? Yeah, I would say more digital products uh, for, uh, you know, seniors that, you know, explain how to do exercises correctly. You know, because a, a lot of people don't have, either have time or they don't want to go to a gym. It can be intimidating, right? Um, so something that they can, I just haven't seen a lot of uh, products that, I see a lot of stuff about cardiovascular, but I don't see a lot about re quality resistance training uh, instruction and where you can say, okay, I have, you know, a pair of dumbbells. What are the safest exercises that I can do to improve on this? You know, um, I just like to see a lot more of that. Great. Um, thank you. I'm going to turn to a couple of the questions in the chat, <laughs> which align with some of the ones that I had lined up anyway. Um, one is, you know, just, um, this aligns with the idea of awareness that we've already brought up and accessibility like of, that Anju is facing in, in, in reaching the community that they're trying to serve. But how do we, the, the way the question is phrased is how do we break down all the techno speak into language that the target population can assimilate effectively? So I think in, in less jargony question form, that is how can we speak understandably to older adults and get their um, engagement on things which might seem unfamiliar, overwhelming, off-putting given their experiences and backgrounds that they're just not necessarily at as large a percentage engaged on digital um, components. Anybody want to jump on that to start? I'll, I'll start it because it's easier to, it's always good to be the first person because I can say, <laughs> I can give an easy answer, everybody else got to work harder. Um, but um, I think that one thing about older adults, and I think we mentioned this, is they're much more savvy than they were five years ago or 20 years ago um, when I can remember doing something called Senior Surf the Web. And it was like a very early prototype of just teaching people how to use a mouse. This is a mouse, right? Like this is a mouse. Um, so I think older people have come a long way, not all, but many have. And so I think the danger there is sort of be too, to speak down to them. Um, I, Cause I think that can be an issue. I think everybody's gotta get really um, very sensitive to where people are with technology um, because you know, that's a vulnerability for people and they don't like that. And, and that can also be, you know, going back to my old work that I do but it also can open up avenues for mistreatment. So, or not exactly veracity. So I think, you know, getting a better, more elegant understanding of the abilities of older adults, some of which are vast, um, mm -hmm. as well as creating something that a people, that people who live in areas that have lower bandwidth and they're going to for some time can access. So it isn't so crazy that everything freezes and they get nothing else. 
Yeah, no, I, mean, th I think that's a great point. And um, it's also one of my questions is also about the fact that we're kind of talking about older adults, but in fact, you know, using AARP sort of a distinguishment of 50 and above, there's a huge range of both people and capabilities and, and experiences in people 50 above. So the 50 to 60 cohort right now in 2021 are people who have spent most of their professional life online with email, with digital services, um, even if they didn't grow up with the internet. Whereas the people in the sort of 70 to 80 or 80 and above cohorts, you know, had a very different experience and came to it 20 or 30 years later um, and had even less of their young professional life, early professional life using some of these services. And that transition, I think we're going to see continue over these next couple of decades as the people who grew up with the internet start to reach, um, you know, middle age or, or older years and have, again, a very different set of expectations because they've lived their whole life with a certain amount of engagement and experiences that they're gonna to expect to continue. And they're gonna expect these services to be targeted to them and, and catering to them and providing the things that um, meet their needs as their physical abilities or mental abilities or just general needs and, and priorities change in retirement or things like that. So I think that's gonna be an ongoing challenge for the providers of these services as well as sort of the family and, and social interactions of that. Anybody else wanna jump on that though after Pam? Yeah, I'd love to add that. I, I mean, I'm a bit of a of like a technology fangirl. Um, product design has so much to do with, I think, the adoption of them. Uh, so even Zoom right now is a preferred client of, over Teams or any other clunkier um, web conferencing or video conferencing tool. Uh, and that's what we find with our clients, too. Um, just being able to, so first the product design has implications for the barriers of entry. And then I think on top of that, if we layer on principles of universal design to try and design things towards the lowest common denominator, not just for older adults, but also for children, also for people with disabilities, being able to lace in principles of accessibility, um, I think will continue to promote uh, further adoption and be able to have greater engagement across all, all groups. Um, and then I also think that there's this plain and simple just investment in resource for education. Uh, sometimes, as a, excuse me, an attendee had asked a question of how to prepare, like how to give instruction on using software remotely. Yeah, sometimes it just means blocking off 30 minutes of time and then being able to have these people to come in, ask questions, play around with it, do all the learning in advance. And I think this goes in line with what Dr. Teaster was saying of, um, you know, there's no condescension to it. This is purely educational. Uh, everyone's learning and it's not even your age isn't an indicator of how fluent you will be with it. You know, the founders of the internet now are all 50 plus. Um, I'm sure they have a lot more capacity with coding than I do. Uh, so um, just having, just kind of losing that discrimination and being able to design communications appropriately for, ed for like for educational purposes, I think would also be a very cheap fix to um, improving adoption. I, I would add to that, um, I think storytelling and experiences help greatly. If they can hear stories of peers or experiences or scenarios that they may find themselves in that are relatable, they're much more in a position to respond or take some type of action. So for example, in the presentation, I'm sure that everybody could relate to pictures being trapped in an iCloud and how dreadful that would be. That's much different than talking about digital asset succession management and trying to talk about these digitized images that we've caught over a number of generations that are then stored up in megabytes up in in, in, a, in cloud, which many people still not exactly sure what the cloud itself is, uh, but by relating it in, an, in a language that we all speak, I think it makes it more, pe more comfortable for people to be able to do whatever we want them to do and, and protect themselves and their privacy if they understand what's at risk. Jim, I wanna hear what you th your thoughts are on this too, because I think you probably have, um, kind of a double uh, communication issue and that 
I don't want to overgeneralize. This is your area, but my experience is that as people get older, especially if they haven't been real athletic or really active during their lives, they sort of have this mental idea that they can't be now or that, you know, weightlifting is an all or nothing, like total gym regimen kind of thing. And so I think you're likely to face, you know, some of that as well. And then you have sort of the technology accessing it through, you know, digital services or whatever. What, what are your thoughts on like how to make that friendly and accessible and desirable for, for people? Yeah. I mean, I think the point about using stories is great. So if I tell someone just starting or they're, they're as worried about the, the biggest fear is getting hurt. That's the biggest fear. Um, so that's why I went back to quality instruction, but, um, you know, if I used the the story that I told about Rena, who started off just doing this and was scared to death of lifting, and then you know is is super confident now and is is put sixty pounds on her deadlift, and um, you know talk about success stories like that, and say or or you know oh I have a bad shoulder, I have a bad low back. Well, here's what we're gonna do, and here's here's how we're gonna do it, and here's how it's not gonna get you hurt. And here's what this person did, and this is how how they you know conquered that issue. So, um, I love using examples because it's something that, that they can relate to, you know. Yeah, and 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 I try not to do the physiology thing, you know, right away with you know the textbook. It's more like here's how this is going to help you in life. You break it down to that, and everybody understands it. Great. We're we're reaching the end of our uh, discussion period here, so I want to wrap up with a. a concept that is reflected in several of the questions in the Q&A, which has to do, and I think it's particularly relevant in the population that we're talking about, of sort of like walking that fine line between agency and safety and care, uh, paternalism versus autonomy. Um, you know, what are what are your thoughts on how to, to do that responsibly or proactively in ways that respect people's individual dignity and, and um, decision making, but also acknowledging that there is a point in many people's lives where they are not better off by being left to their own devices and, and need assistance in some way? Who wants to kick that off? Pam, you want to take that one? Uh, I'm glad to go first. Um, <laughs> so. So really, the way that we should think about these things, it's not easy, is, is older adults in the community and what do they, what would they like and, and publicize that you have done that versus imposing stuff on them and a presu presumption as we do about guardianship, I bet Lee's nodding, um, that particularly that we make a presumption that everybody has capacity to make decisions about themselves and make mistakes before we strip it away from them. And that is a really important piece. I also think being proactive now versus reactive when there's a, a, a big old problem that, that everybody's running around to try to solve. I, didn't, I can't believe she gave $500 of cab fare to so-and-so with her credit card. Um, to, to be a little bit more proactive on the front end will be better than having to deal with a catastrophe on the back end, but not to presume that just because you are 50, 60, 70, whatever age, all of a sudden you can't manage your affairs and you start stripping that autonomy away from people will be a great disservice to everybody. But, but more often than not, include the old, older people in the piece of it and have it less look so much like somebody's imposing um, the magnifying glass or the camera on them. And we've been down that road legally, I'm sure we would say. Sure. All right, we, we have about one minute. Anybody else want to jump in on that with thoughts um, on that last question? Uh, I will, because I think the for my particular area, the, the planning and the preparation is incredibly critical. And mistakes made today have permanent consequences tomorrow. In many cases, not recoverable. And that can be not only damaging to the person's estate, but to generations behind them. And while there, it, there is a capacity, we should probably take advantage of that for people to plan ahead, to think about what they want, to, put, to push them to make their own decisions and let them know that if they don't, it could be forced into a decision made by somebody else and it may not be in their best interest. So we wanna make sure we're educating them that the decisions they make today should be empowering, should be 
uh, helping to preserve what their goals are in the future. And it will also help conflict after they've passed in our world. So I 100% I agree. I know I find myself now agreeing with Pamela quite a bit um, that the preparation, the planning is extremely critical. And if you can get them to make their own decisions, they're gonna feel much better about that. Great. All right, well, um, I know that we could keep talking about a lot of these things for a lot longer, at least I could, because I'm finding it fascinating, but we do have to wrap up this panel. Um, thanks to all of our speakers for participating in this panel. Very much appreciate your expertise and taking the time to share that with us. Um, for all the participants, we are going to take a five minute break so you can walk away from your computer for a minute if you need to. We will reconvene back here at about 11.18 and uh, get ready for our keynote speaker to do her presentation. So thank you for joining us. Please stay with us. It's going to be a great presentation. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Just as a reminder, this event is being recorded. Uh, I'm Brenda Leong from the Future of Privacy Forum, co-hosting this event today with AARP. And we are now ready to tee up our keynote speaker. I hope you were all here for the first panel, which was really fascinating about a lot of social issues involving technology for older adults. And um, I think a lot of that's going to come together in this presentation. So we're now going to hear from Dr. Clara Barrage, the assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Washington. Dr. Barrage is a gerontologist whose research focuses on the ethical and policy implications of digital technologies and the AI used in elder care. She asks questions about how to promote social technical practices in ways that do not marginalize, isolate, or diminish their participants. And across projects, she's often thinking about privacy, power, and decision-making about technology use. Her training includes an NMSW, PhD in social welfare from UC Berkeley, and postdoctoral fellowship with the Center for Gerontology and Healthcare Research at Brown University. Dr. Barrage, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, and hats off to AARP and FPF for acting on the need to have conversations about the representation of older adults in AI design and data. We've seen some brilliant recent work on how systems are automating racism, poverty, and gender inequity. The images here on the slide are of two book covers of examples of that work. One is Virginia Eubanks about automating decision-making. It's titled Automating Inequality, How High-Tech Tools Profile, Police, and Punish the Poor. And then Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology. So the work in this critical vein illustrates how technology can reinforce inequalities and amplify hierarchies. And these writers make it crystal clear that technological choices are not apolitical nor inevitable. And these works also dive deeper than approaches um, to say, tweak the algorithm uh, to make it more fair or less biased. So in the context of these larger conversations, it makes perfect sense that we would be turning to the question, in what ways do we risk automating ageism? We aging researchers, people in gerontology and advocates are behind in having this conversation about AI and data intensive tech. One reason is reflected in the oft repeated statement that gerontology is data rich, but theory poor. While that's improving relative to class and race and gender and disability, age relations are under theorized. And so I wanna highlight a new subfield that is on top of these conversations, straddling this divide of aging studies and science and technology studies. It's called sociogerant technology. It's a mouthful to, to get the representation of multiple disciplines in there. It's a young network that brings together scholars from various social sciences and design disciplines interested in critical studies of aging and technology. This is a cover of an important book coming out in about a week and the URL to the network's page. It's called sociogerant technology, interdisciplinary, critical studies of aging and technology. So I just want you to be aware that age tech relations are getting some much needed attention through interdisciplinary scholars like those in sociogerant technology. But back to work that is motivating this project that brings us together today. We know that the question we're starting with is not, are we at risk of automating ageism through data intensive tech? Because we know that technologies are human made tools that cannot help but reflect and if scaled amplify social inequities and biases. Pamela talked about elder abuse. I think top of mind with the very recent tragedy in Atlanta are intensified attacks directed at Asian elders. We live in a society that can be characterized as ageist. 
and therefore there is no way our technologies are avoiding ageism completely. So it's important to talk about representation and it needs to be with an intersectional lens, not an additive one. So don't forget that older adults are in these stories already being told by people like Dr. Eubanks and Benjamin, um, even if aging is not called out. So the people living in poverty in Dr. Eubanks book who get cut off Medicaid due to automated decision-making systems are also older adults with low incomes who might be losing Medicaid coverage for their disabled adult children who they're supporting. Something that isn't a new conversation for gerontology is how old age and older adults are represented. So from Stephen Katz's 1996 Disciplining Old Age, the book covers pictured here, where he traces the genealogy of gerontology to writing on compassionate ageism, to theorizing about the fourth age, these works have shown how representation is a constant struggle. One thing we can draw from this is appreciation for how challenging and political a representation of old age is. We're talking about a huge diverse group. Um, as a gerontologist, I think starting age 65, but according to AARP, we're thinking about starting 50, all the way to say 115, spanning multiple generations and cohorts. So this is going to pose significant issues for data representation in AI. We've all seen the complexities of representation of older adults play out during the pandemic, especially of people saying, who are you calling vulnerable? It's not me, it's them. This distancing from vulnerability among non-disabled younger older adults, which is understandable, but also contributes to othering, to more openly ageist public comments that I won't repeat, to reflexive work on compassionate ageism. So questions age study scholars engage with, along with anti-ageism activists, are who's vulnerable, and how did they become vulnerable? Vulnerability tends to become naturalized, but congregate nursing home settings that are underfunded aren't natural. So how are certain older adults made vulnerable, like older Black, Indigenous people of color? Anju talked about internet access issues in the previous panel. The digital divide and age-based digital marginalization, which has been made so urgent during COVID, has also been shown to be intensified for those older adults experiencing a lifetime of racism and those who are economically disadvantaged. So you want to ask, how do we represent older adults in AI data and design? First, I think we've got to see what a fraught question that's going to be. So here's what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time talking with you about. I'll describe some, um, some of the reasons we've had pretty low uptake in care technologies for older adults. Uh, I'm gonna introduce this idea of an interventionist logic as one um, component of that explanation and thinking about how we can improve research and design for older adults. Um, I'm going to talk about how values are embedded in technologies, common risk associated with technologies used in elder care specifically, and then um, how those risks can play out in practice in some of my research. A few months ago, I surveyed 900 people over 50 about their comfort with a range of care technologies, from location tracking to telepresence to conversation analysis to artificial companion robots. And then I asked how important these options would be that are shown on the screen. As shown on this table from left to right, they could select not at all important, all the way to extremely important. So to be reminded every now and then about what information a technology collects about you, to have your primary support person check in with you now and then about whether you've changed your mind about using the technology, to be able to control when a video chat on wheels is turned on if you had one in your home, to have the ability to pause a technology in your home when you want privacy. So if you look at the percentages of people who selected on the far right, important or extremely important, it's pretty clear that these control and participation options matter to people. The percentage of people who felt that pausing a technology, for example, is an option that is important or extremely important is 94. Another survey that I did this time with experts who are gerontologists technologists in the um, uh, or who have expertise in gerontology technology in the States and Canada showed that they agreed that designers should adhere to the core design principle of providing personal control options for any system that monitors individual activities. And one who had a lot of field experience explained the importance of enabling a pause option. Her prior work found that allowing the older adult to pause whatever the technology is helped with their concerns. She said that they rarely paused it, but being able to was psychologically calming. And I think that would make sense to most people why that would be important. That's not what older adults are getting in technologies designed to support aging in place or care. There is a disconnect. The image on the screen is of two cords that are disconnected. And widespread adoption of those kinds of technologies remains elusive. There are numerous reasons for this, and I'm going to overview some of the big ones. 
Alexander Payne and Lewis Maven have named one of the limitations we're running up against uh, an interventionist logic that has dominated. They're making explicit some theoretical assumptions that have been implicit in design and research by naming it. So they explain how gerund technology has taken a very limited linear approach. The interventionist logic conceptualizes aging as a target for technological interventions uh, as, a, as a set of problems to be solved. So, so here's kind of how that works. A problem is identified, a user is imagined, a technology is designed to address it, it's implemented with real older adults who then need to match the imagined user profile. Uh, they use the technology in the way prescribed or scripted. Its impact is evaluated using predefined outcomes. This is very linear, as you can see, and everything needs to go as planned and people and the tech need to act as predicted. The alternative, more generative approach, they argue, is to first recognize that aging and technology are co-constituted. So what does that mean? Age technology relations are cyclical, not linear. Technology is shaped by ideas about aging. The technology will be different depending on how older people are imagined by the designers and engineers. So if they're imagined as active versus frail or tech literate versus tech illiterate. Aging is also shaped by technology. So think about Lee's presentation just now. How do digital technologies help shape the idea of legacy that's so central to aging? Or Payne and Nathan give the example of how aging has changed with the large scale use of Facebook and Zoom by older adults. Aging and technology are mutually shaping. Like all of us, engineers and designers are always socially positioned. So the social norms and ideas they have about aging influence how they envision solutions. And some of them of course are ageist or stereotyping. An example would be um, algorithms that trigger alerts based on deviating from one's routine uh, you could say that that's based on a stereotype that older adults are creatures of habit, that they may not deviate from routine. So the older adult using that technology is put in a position to answer for their behavior that other people are not made to answer for if it's not within set parameters. So devices or systems come with ideas about the user inscribed in them. And those ideas often turn out to be pretty limited and thus limiting. And we often end up with simplistic user representations. Older adults want X or R, Y, end of story, when the reality is so much more complex and people so much more diverse. We have a lack of participatory democratic design processes where older adults are involved from the get-go in tech development. And gerund technology has been slow to engage with ethics. A recent systematic review found that most, that is 67% of dementia care technologies have been developed without explicit consideration of any ethical, ethical principles. That's what Marcello Yenka's article listed here um, uh, covers. Research, and I, I gave you a couple of resources on this slide because I'm not going to go in great detail because I know the next panel is going to talk about ethics. But researchers have found um, that user dissatisfaction and adoption barriers result when ethics and implicated values are not engaged in the development of devices. Some of these ethical issues are related to autonomy, informed consent, dignity, and access or distributive justice, along with threats to values like privacy and identity. We need more ethics conversations, but we also need more focus on power. One reason we need this that has surfaced in my research is because the surveilling nature of some of these technologies and the power caregivers, for example, can have over their care partner um, can also put important values and family members themselves in tension with one another. So how are our technologies amplifying or addressing power imbalances, both social power structures and interpersonal power dynamics? Uh, my brilliant colleague at the University of Washington at the I School, Anna Lauren Hoffman, reminds us that, quote, doing ethics will mean attending to histories, dynamics, and relationships that exceed any given tool or technology. Ethical debate, she goes on, is not only about values, but about how we account for certain non-ideal facts about the world. Non-ideal facts include, um, for example, the fact that not everyone is capable of giving informed consent or opting out. Um, oppression is a non-ideal fact of the world, which is visible in structural ageism and ableism. Paternalism characterizes a lot of elder care as was discussed in the previous panel, but so does abandonment. So having limited options to get needed support is certainly disempowering. Some have pointed out that as a society, we're deeply invested in the belief that technology is ethically neutral. 
how many of you have heard the adage that tech can be used for good or bad? It just depends on the user and how they choose to use it. That's partly true, but sociogerant technology embraces the idea that technologies themselves are not value neutral. Values are embedded in tech and tech reinforces values. It mediates care and other types of relationships and it introduces new norms. Tech is also social in the same way ideas about aging get embedded in devices themselves. Expectations and cultural assumptions, not only about the user, but about values permeate design. Uh, my late grandmother, for whom clothing style was important, referred to her PERS device, um, some kind called, called a life alert. It's the personal emergency response button as the shoestring around my neck. How undignified it felt to her. That design, the early designs, um, are a consequence of a simplistic user representation. User value safety, full stop. The wearer looks like they're a patient. There was no room in that design for the user to also value identity or dignity. So then we can ask of a given technology, what values are emphasized? Is it risk management? Is it independence, safety, privacy? Which values are prioritized? Now I'll turn to what's at stake when values are put in tension, but first a note on the specific kinds of technologies I'm about to talk about because there are a lot of applications for AI relevant to aging. Obviously in healthcare, it can help analyze medical records and process large data sets. Voice activated systems based on Alexa come in many forms like robots. Um, they can be used for entertainment, connection information, supporting rehabilitation at home and cueing people living with dementia to help with daily tasks. AI can be used to coordinate data streams from technologies like activity sensors, smart homes, and behavioral biometrics from wearables. And these are the kinds of technologies I'll be referring to. Many are focused on risk prediction. AI is generally used to detect patterns in newly collected data, and then algorithms predict something is going to happen, often a health event or a fall or something of that nature. And the data may include movements or time and duration of activities. The data could even be audio or video. There's excitement about the potential future capability of detecting cognitive change using predictive linguistic markers. Not all of these technologies use AI, but are likely ripe for AI application. In the expert survey that I referenced earlier, I asked Jaren Technology Domain experts about what technologies will be most prevalent for dementia care in five years, and they arrived at 12 technologies. These range from location tracking inside and outside of the home, biometric data collection, using an AI virtual agent for non-human companionship, telepresence on wheels, et cetera. Um, the major component, uh, or sorry, the major potential benefit of these technologies are prolonging independent living and caregiver peace of mind. And these experts also reported the most common risks associated with each technology. And I'm presenting to you the aggregated most common risks across these 12. They're spread, uh, the risks are spread across four slides. I'm gonna take you through these fairly quickly and then we'll zoom into some real world examples. So number one, privacy threat. Uh, they can also cause uncomfortable feelings either from feeling like one isn't free in their home to do as they please, feeling babysat or feeling that there's no place to hide. Those can lead to fear, paranoia, depression or anxiety. Information or alert overload and caregiver fatigue were cited as likely to make caregivers anxious. Other commonalities across technologies included a false sense of security. When a caregiver feels they are getting the monitoring information that they need through the technology, they may, it could lead them um, to do fewer check-ins to the detriment or in some cases the benefit of the older adult. It could be experienced as harassing, um, questioning by caregivers and not being given room to depart from routine were commonly cited risks. Older adults uh, changing behavior to conform. This showed up too in another couple of studies I did on actual use of sensor a sensor system that I'll share in a minute. And participants voice concern that recordings that lead to knowledge of non-adherence or high-risk activities could in turn lead to increased premiums or denial of healthcare coverage at some point in the future. Uh, concern over the security of audio and other data types was another of these common issues. Participants emphasized both security risk and nefarious use as unresolved problems. The idea of big data collection being needed without much knowledge for where it may end up. So one reason it's important to take risk seriously <clears throat> is there is some evidence that older adults and their adult children may not agree on the risk benefit analysis of monitoring technologies. A couple of years ago, I conducted a study 
in which Meals on Wheels clients without dementia and an adult child of theirs were separately interviewed. I'll refer to these as dyads, the, the older adult who's using Meals on Wheels and their primary support person. In this case, it was always ch adult child. Each person was represented, sorry, each person um, uh, had each of three technologies described to them. These are geo-tracking, uh, in-home activity sensors, and cameras. And in-home activity sensors, um, a, a system of four or five sensors was described. Um, for example, a sensor might be on a bathroom door um, and a change in number of times, a good motion sensor, a change of a number of times people are using the bathroom at night could indicate a possible UTI. If somebody's not getting out of their bedroom or out of bed um, as at the same time that they usually do, that could indicate that somebody has a health problem. Um, so some of those technologies are pictured here. And we assessed older adults' comprehension of the basic functions of each of these. We found that adult, adult children preferred each technology more than their parent did. That is, adult children were far more open to considering use of any of these technologies now or in the near future um, than were their parents. And the more potentially invasive the technology, um, so thinking in order of uh, geo-tracking sensors and cameras, the more likely a disagreement. The primary but not only objective to any of these was privacy invasion. I think that's the most intuitive one. Privacy is not the only value that can get interrupted, but as I'll describe, it can be thought of as a foundational value that other values depend on. So you can see in these, um, these are themes of how people responded. These are the Meals on Wheels clients to the question of what does privacy mean to you? Um, to do as I please, to not be told what or how to do, or what to do or how, to do something in private without people knowing things about you, being alone, not feeling watched. So there's this interaction between privacy and freedom or autonomy. Here's another example. I asked a Meals on Wheels client, how would you feel if your daughter asked you to have a web camera in your house? She said, I wouldn't feel good because I'd be afraid to do anything because I know the camera's watching. So I said, when, you're, when you say afraid to do anything, can you give me an example? She said, uh, suppose I'm not supposed to cheat and I, laughing, uh, go in the refrigerator and get something. In many situations, observing those behaviors is precisely why a family member wants to install a monitoring technology. So this raises an important question of what happens when there is uh, this collision of values. A son of a Meals on Wheels client explained in response to our conversation about the sensors, um, he said there is some level of privacy that's taken away. And depending on the person, it could affect how they lead their lives or how they feel like they can lead their life. Your life is open and exposed in a way that it wasn't. He went on to say, the more and more one feels one's privacy is being invaded, the more and more degraded some can feel. So again, he's connecting privacy to feeling unrestricted to do what I want to do. As you can see, privacy is not just an intrinsic value, not just valuable for privacy's sake, but it's integral and necessary to enjoy other values that we care about, like freedom, like autonomy, identity, trust, the freedom to be nonconformist. And some adult children felt it would be important that their parent understand the function of a technology before they decide to use it, while others thought that it would cause pushback. Even when older parents are living at home and capable of giving consent, adult children reported that they may judge it easier to install monitoring devices without discussion to avoid potential conflict. And relatedly, we found that every adult child underestimated their parents' ability to comprehend the basic functions of technology. So, this is one of the reasons we assessed comprehension. This aligns with previous research showing how younger people grossly underestimate the capacity of older adults. And this underestimation, I think, has implications for the extent to which adult children would seek informed consent from their parents or involve them in decision making. And this may be a problem because care partners may have different understandings of what is at stake in monitoring practices. These are rooted in values that they may weigh differently. Here's a representative example of this divergence within a dyad about an in-home motion sensor system. So uh, a adult daughter, I'm gonna call her Lynn, was responding to questions about um, whether she thought that her mother would want the sensor system. And she said, my mom is very adaptable and cooperative. Yeah, she wouldn't mind any of it. If she knew that it would be helpful to take care of her and also to keep the family at ease, she would cooperate. And then here's her mother in a separate interview about sensors. And, she refers to Teresa, and Teresa is a hypothetical person who we use as in vignettes 
to describe, you know, Teresa is an 80 year old woman who uh, enjoys living at home in her apartment. She recently had a fall and her, parent, her children think she's getting forgetful. They ask her to use these sensors. What do you think is on Teresa's mind if she hears this? And this is a way of sort of warming up and getting people talking about it. And then we ask them to reflect on what would you want? In this particular case, Jude, after talking about Teresa said, oh, I'm Teresa. This, that's exactly how I would feel. So she says, I think her children are really being good. They want to take care of her and she wants them to mind their own business. I think the whole thing is terrible. She has no privacy. How many times she goes to the bathroom, when she gets up, oh, and when she has people come in, hmm, I think that's terrible, she laughs. She'd feel like it's the Gestapo checking on her. So having a family member negotiate boundaries on an older adult's behalf is all well and good, unless you don't share ideas about those boundaries. And we generally find that, that people have some, some different ideas about boundaries, even in, in families with close relationships. Those findings from that dyad study of tension in the decision about whether or not to use a monitoring technology align with another study that examined actual use of in-home activity sensors in independent living apartments. Um, it was HUD senior housing um, that staffed social workers in this case. When we examined actual decision-making processes about the sensor system, both social workers and family members reported using a range of techniques to convince reluctant residents to have the system in their apartment including continuing to push the idea after the person said no, appealing to the idea that adoption is the right thing to do, issuing ultimatums, it's this, you have the sensor system or you're going to move to a nursing home, or simply bypassing the older adult. I, I would call this a form of benevolent coercion. And the behavior disruption the Meals on Wheels clients anticipated was experienced by the independent living residents who reported on what, the, what it was like for them to live with activity sensors. Some reported becoming hypervigilant, knowing one's movements were tracked, rushing in the bathroom so as not to trigger an alert, avoiding sleeping in a favorite chair for fear of being inactive for too long. It actually caused people to feel that by deviating from what was set to be the normal behavior or the sort of the allowable without alert behavior made them deviants. They apologized um, for, in their own words, causing trouble. Moving on to the third moment where boundary intrusion can occur in practice, one way to avoid conflict and to convince residents to adopt um, was not to lay out in a clear way all of the information that the sensor system collects about them. This bypassing of informed consent then had consequences later on when the sensors would trigger alerts and a caregiver needed to follow up about them. Um, they needed to explain why they were asking or sort of conceal that. And, and they tended to opt to conceal why they would be asking. Excuse me. When I interviewed those who had sensors in their apartment, one in three, and remember, these are people who are not living with dementia uh, in independent living. One in three current users had no knowledge that any information was collected about them by the sensors. And uh, then caregivers found themselves caught in a loop of misleading the person because they weren't aware the resident um, they, 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 were, they might be concerned that the resident could find it creepy or alarming if they, they were to remind them that they have these sensors. So in practice, boundaries are easy to cross. And here are th uh, three examples of ways that they can be crossed. So here are some questions that this work raises. And I think we've, we started talking about it at the end of the last panel. Um, how should technologies be presented to older adults to enable informed participation in decisions and appreciation for what a given technology would mean for their lives? These are areas I'm focusing on now because my research has led me here, and hopefully I've convinced you that these are important questions, though they are only some of many as we look to integrate technologies in ways that people and families can feel good about and even experience as empowering. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Clara. That was great. So much information there. And um, I have many thoughts and questions, which I'm sure we won't get to all um, uh, to today. But um, I do want to tee up my colleague, Dr. Sarah Jordan, who is going to be moderating the second panel, who uh, has a, a question that she wants to ask you to, to lead this off. So Sarah, you want to take it away? Sure. Thank you so much, Clara. That was uh, really informative. I love what you're talking about in terms of the dyads between individuals and the, you know, the older person and the you know, younger potential caretaker, the person who's op kind of operating the sensors. But 
One of the things that strikes me about uh, your whole presentation is that we're talking about the challenge of trying to make tech more senior friendly. And one of the things that seems to need to be a corollary here is how do we make society more friendly towards tech enabled or tech using seniors? It seems that sometimes there is um, a desire to, that, to, to bend tech um, rather than to bend society. Um, what would you say we need to do in order to make ourselves more friendly to seniors who want to be, be more robust in their technological capabilities and, and use tech more freely? That's a good question. Um, I mean, we're talking about such a diverse group of people and my work focuses on uh, people who are um, using some kind of form of support or maybe um, uh, in a situation where family members or caregivers, loved ones are starting to worry about them and wanting to add in some kind of technology to support them. And generally those technologies have been designed for the caregiver in mind, um, not, not necessarily taking into consideration the preferences and um, desires of the older adults. And so in that way, I do think technology needs to bend to older adults. And, you know, in the very first where I had the um, not very important to very important slide, people want options. So personalizing technology is really important. Um, and I think I think that's something that we haven't seen happen very much. Um, so I would recommend that. And then I think that um, I think the pandemic has really prompted a lot of organizations that work with and serve older adults to move things online and to get more savvy about how they need to start hybriding, even going forward, even when we could be back in person, um, how we can start, uh, you know, senior center. I've, I've done some interviews with senior center directors and, and they're thinking about, okay, what's the senior center of the future? Um, and realizing that they could step up their innovation and, and, and be more creative to match, to meet the people who, who are ready for that and interested in that, you know, maybe incorporating gaming. And I've seen some, some centers do that already. You know, you can play various games with people in New York and LA between centers. So there's a lot of work there. I think um, in terms of designing more uh, sort of high-tech products for older adults, I think we're, we're moving in that direction. The mar I mean, I think the market has been recognized. Um, so I'm not sure how else to, did I, did I answer your question? Sure, thank you. Um, I think we also have another one here in the Q&A. Uh, Brenda, do you wanna introduce that one or? Yeah, I definitely wanna try to squeeze that one in. It'll probably be the last one we can do right now, um, just in the interest of time. But really good question from, from leaving us with a cliffhanger there. Um, you described the different perceptions and maybe even values of the older generation and the the grown child that they were working with or, or engaged with, what happened in the study in terms of like, did that ever come back at the end? Like they were, were they sort of given insight into each other's answers, either in an aggregated general sense, if not necessarily a your kid and your parent disagreed with you sense? How did that resolve? That's a great question. No, I didn't go back to people and kind of give them some summary of the findings. I mean, I published it in an academic journal and um, I had a couple of people ask me to send that to them who were actually interested in diving into that. So I did. I, I actually, in the, during the study, I wanted to avoid them communicating because I wanted to sort of see on their own what their preferences were before they start to influence each other. But certainly um, I would, I would show up for an interview the day after interviewing another family member of that person. And they would say, my, my mom called me and she said, you better not use a sensor in my home. Uh -huh. So I, I'm sure it sparked conversation. And in, that's some of my, my work that I'm doing now is all about trying to facilitate conversation um, and getting kind of scaffolding the ability to talk to each other about values to support technology use that works for individual families and individuals. Great, Thank, thanks very much. I'm, I'm sure there were some interesting Thanksgiving Day conversations <laughs> post-study in some household, so good to know. Um, okay, unfortunately, in the interest of time, we're gonna have to uh, wrap up here. Dr. Verich, thank you so much for your very informative overview of both the general history of um, this topic and then the specific study that you conducted. I would love to, to talk further about the work that you've done and hopefully we can do that in the future. So. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will now take another five minute break.
and uh, let everybody stretch their legs or walk away and get fresh coffee or whatever you need to do. And we will start back up just a couple of minutes before the hour with our second panel. Please stay with us. This is gonna be a great panel, really focused in on some of the technology design and decision issues. Um, and as Dr. Barrage said, technology is never neutral. It is values-based inherent in the design choices that are made. And so I think that's gonna become even more obvious as we have this discussion about robotics and data sets and uh, pattern analysis and all those kinds of things and representation. So please come back in five minutes and we'll kick it off then. Good afternoon and welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you had an enjoyable break and were able to get yourself a cup of coffee because I know if you're like me, you've been listening to with intense excitement to the social panel, but you're wondering, where are the automated cars? Where are the robots? Where is the tech? So this afternoon, we're going to have a really engaging three-person panel where we're going to have exactly that come to you. So this afternoon, I'm delighted to be joined by three people who I'll briefly introduce um, here momentarily and, and then let them take it away. We're pleased to be joined by John Anton, who is our first speaker, who is part of the Human Factors Research Science Group at Virginia Tech uh, Transportation Institute. John is the leader of the Senior Mobility Awareness, Safety, and Health, the SMASH group at VTTI, which is a kind of a nifty little name. He is part of NHTSA's and uh, Virginia DMV's Mature Driver Committee, and we're really excited to hear from him on the effect the interaction between senior drivers and automated vehicles or increasingly automated vehicles. Following John's presentation, you're gonna hear from Kirsten Haring, who's coming to us from around the globe um, as she has a, her, uh, she's currently at University of Denver in their Department of Computer Science, where she's leading the Humane Robot Technology Lab there. I'm really curious to hear more about this. But before that, she was working in human machine teaming in the US Air Force Academy, got her PhD at University of Tokyo in Japan. So I'm sure she could tell us some very interesting robotic stories and culture and robotic stories from that interaction or from her work in uh, University of Freiburg in Germany. We're really excited to hear Kristen, Kristen tell us more about trust, collaboration and ethics in human computer interaction. Then we're also super stoked to hear from Mark Diaz, who's coming to us from um, Google and their ethical AI team, where he's a research scientist who is working on probing the origins of social bias in data sets um, and talking about their influence of that on algorithmic performance. Mark has tremendous experience in studying age bias in language models, those really big language models you hear about in the news, right, um, that are used for sentiment analysis. And he's gonna give us some exploration about uh, the, the implications of how we talk about age for training AI to, well, speak back to us in a sensitive way about age and aging. So that's, our very brief introduction, I'd like to turn this over um, with thanks to John Anton from Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let me uh, who can share all oh, panelists only host. So I think someone needs to stop sharing. Perhaps. Nobody's sharing anything right now. You should be okay. Should be all set, John. Um, okay. There you go. Great. So again, thanks, Sarah, for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. I certainly enjoyed the, the first panel. Um, I hope we can do my part to, to live up to that and to live up to my esteemed fellow panelists and uh, enjoyed the keynote speaker as well. So I'm gonna be talking about senior. I saw someone left a comment that it's no, not cool to use the term senior. I mean it as a term of respect, but uh, senior or older adult drivers. And so, the first point is that uh, driving is in fact still the primary mode of travel for older adults. 
if you look on the left side of the chart, we're looking at ages 65 to 74, and you can see it's the dominant mode of travel by far, around 70%, just under 70%. And if you look on the right side of the chart, um, we're looking at ages 75 and above, and um, you can see the same thing. It's less pronounced, but it's still over 60%. And this is roughly over the last 20 or so years. It's been a consistent pattern. So what happens if driving is threatened or reduced or taken away? Well, there are some notable health-related uh, problems that we see with reduced mobility, things like depression, uh, feelings, you know, related feelings of isolation, loneliness, shortened lifespan, which is obviously a bad problem, poor physical condition. We heard about physical conditioning in the last uh, panel and obviously reduce participation in you know, other activities if you're less mobile and impair, even impaired cognitive function. So what are the risk factors for senior drivers? Um, you know, there's a wide variety of things that might lead to the reduction or cessation of driving. So functional impairment across a broad array of, of our faculties, uh, notably cognitive impairment, but also obvious uh, perception, psychomotor ability and physical strength and flexibility medicines and uh, medical conditions, and particularly uh, the polypharmacology where multiple medications are uh, prescribed by different providers who perhaps don't know completely what's going on, and you get the interactive effects of, of a broad array of medicines. Frailty and fragility, um, which just greatly magnify the impact um, of a particular crash, and not to mention the ability to drive. A variety of training issues and bad habits, and of course, as we talked about, just the reduced mobility. Safety is not the only concern. So what are the kinds of uh, you know, interventions or countermeasures that we can implement? It's just a broad array of them. I have some of them noted here. Training, um, we have cognitive or brain, so-called brain training, physical training, and these, these have all been researched in the literature, as well as just driver information training. For example, the AARP course, and I've had the uh, honor and pleasure to be able to uh, serve as a reviewer for that course um, several times. Uh, implementing driving restrictions, you know, sometimes people either self-restrict or have restrictions imposed, drive less at night or shorter distances, avoid uh, difficult situations like unprotected uh, you know, left turns across paths. We have fitness to drive screening. And a lot of times when people hear that or see that they're thinking, you know, we got to get these people off the road, but that, that's really the, the last option. Better option is to screen people, figure out what's going on, what's wrong, and what can we do to improve the situation, what kind of uh, interventions or countermeasures can we implement to help people keeping, uh, keep driving longer and safer. And of course, there's technology. So that's what this panel is all about. Um, we have safer cars, both active and passive safety. Um, and, and, and where I'm going to go next is we have high-tech solutions. So we have ADAS, or what are known as uh, advanced driver assistance systems and related automated systems. So that's just an example of an unprotected left turn across path. So we did a study, and, and this, I think similar thoughts were echoed by some of the other panelists uh, in the previous panel, but we did a study of a thousand people across the country and across multiple generations to ask about their attitudes towards certain advanced, uh, an array of advanced technologies. We found that the oldest generation, the silent generation, exhibited the, the least interest and comfort with advanced technology. However, they owned and used these kinds of technologies at approximately the same rates as middle generations. So we're gonna come back to this idea again, but the, the big picture here is when we implement these technologies, if they're not accepted, if they're not adopted, then there's no way they can really be effectively you know, used to enhance uh, safety or to, to increase someone's mobility. So just as a uh, possible uh, example of this, we did a study and found a recent study um, of drivers 70 and older and found that very few of them were performing over the shoulder checks when they were doing lane changes. So, an obvious possible implementation or countermeasure here is 
if for whatever reason that you can't or you won't or you aren't doing the over the shoulder checks, we have the advanced driver assistance system, in this case, the blind spot monitor that can play an important role in helping you to understand if there's someone in your blind spot. So to this end, we did a study where, you know, when we're doing the, the previous study I noted, we are talking about asking people about their attitudes towards advanced technologies. But at that time, a couple of years ago, some of these, most of these technologies didn't really exist and people didn't have experience using them. So this study that I'm gonna talk about briefly now is where we took people, senior drivers, older adult drivers, who had no experience with these kinds of technologies and we actually gave them exposure. We let them drive vehicles that, that uh, you know, our study vehicles, they're listed here, um, the Audi, the Infiniti, the Mercedes, and the Volvo. And these were all equipped with these kinds of technologies. You know, they had at least these in common, adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, lane departure alert, and the blind spot warning. And so what we did was we gave them an attitude survey before the study, and then of course one after the study, and then we let them drive these vehicles as they did in, in the real world, as they wanted to, um, <clears throat> for six weeks each. We had nine males and nine females. This is sort of a pilot study. And at the end of the study, we everyone did a focus group. So I'm gonna talk, show a few of the focus group results here. So at the start of the study, you can see the sort of negative initial attitudes are coded in red, neutral ones are coded in white, and the positive ones are coded in green. And we can see that, you know, they're predominantly negative with, you know, it's mixed. But at the end of the six weeks of driving, the attitudes were overwhelmingly positive. So this shows the importance of actual exposure, actual training, getting to use these things in their own way, in their own time and space on real roads, and, and the attitudes got much more positive. Uh, similarly, we found when we asked them about their attitudes, does this, these kinds of systems enhance safety? Um, green means yes, amber means neutral, and no is uh, coded in red, and you can see that the vast majority are greens. Yes, they thought that these things enhanced safety. So the, not going to go into any detail here other than to say, just to note that uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, is currently conducting a study that's very, very similar to the one I just alluded to at a very high level. But this is going to be, you know, have many more participants, 120 participants. And interestingly, with two age groups, sort of a middle age group, 40 to 49, or uh, roughly 40 to 49, and 70 plus. So we'll be able to, to directly, or they'll be able to, to directly compare the middle age versus the older adult age group. So another thing to, to keep to consider as, as we move forward is that the, the, the space that we're talking about is greatly in, expanding. So obviously there's a personal vehicle. We already talked about how that's the primary way people still get around. There's public transit, obviously biking, walking, we're all pedestrians at some point, paratransit for when that's necessary, not, you know, not so novel today, but in recent years, novel uh, ride hailing approaches uh, have been implemented, volunteer drivers, which is similar, but with volunteers, and personal mobility devices. And then the, the landscape even you know, gets more complicated or you know, I'd even say more rich or more interesting. We have telehealth. So don't even necessarily have to be mobile in this case. You visit with your uh, provider uh, via the computer or some other means like what we're doing right now. And drone deliveries. Uh, right here near Virginia Tech is the first place in the country where actual drones uh, were used to deliver uh, goods to uh, seniors. And then of course there's livable communities rethinking not just mobility, but the, the entire way we structure our, our infrastructure and buildings and streets and, and, and our communities. And finally, there's the connected and automated technologies which are gonna you know, rapidly emerging and will continue to emerge um, as we move forward. So what's the, the future of the uh, older adult uh, mobility landscape? Well, as we all know, there's the growth 
in the in the older adult population. We're we're an aging population, um, and there's a big question. And I think several of our uh, previous panelists alluded to this. Our our next group of seniors, the baby boomers, and and the ones the generations that follow, are going to be similar or different to the previous generations. Well, in particular, with respect to how uh, we, I'm a baby boomer, how we uh, adapt to and adopt technological advances, you know, I would say we're probably different. We we're sort of exist on a different part of the technology uh, acceleration curve. And so that, so bottom line is how previous generations behaved and reacted may be different than how current or future ones do. And technologies are gonna continually emerge. So the, the transportation landscape itself is rapidly evolving. Um, we already talked about some of these things, but COVID-19, it kind of feels like it's going away, but in what ways has that you know, permanently changed the ways that we interact uh, with one another in a broad array of, of uh, areas? And in what even constitutes a social interaction? So if you're interacting as we are right now via Zoom, you know, is it impoverished? Is it better? Is it just as good if you're talking to your grandkids that way? Who knows, but it's, it's part of our future. So part of our present. So with that, that concludes my introductory remarks. Thank you, John. That was a very interesting tour and I have a number of questions to ask, but I want to be mindful that we've got two more pre uh, presenters who are gonna come behind uh, this fabulous presentation. If everybody it, can put your questions in the Q&A, we're gonna send these questions back over to the full panel um, when everyone is done with their presentation. So write down those questions that you have for John um, and get prepared to write some questions down from Kirsten, who's gonna talk to us again about humane robot, robot technology. And I'm really interested to see what Kirsten's bringing for us today. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much, Sarah, for the, for, the great, for the great introduction. And I'm Kirsten Herring, and um, I'm at the University of Denver, where I run the um, Humane Robot Technology Lab. And the way I got here, um, where it was, well, yeah, I took a couple of detours around the world. So I, I grew up in Germany, where I've done my um, my master in computer science and, and cognitive science. That's when I started to be really interested in, in people because that's not the usual computer scientist approach, at least not back then. And then I moved to, to Tokyo where I've done a PhD in human robot interaction. So that's when I really dove in into interdisciplinary science, right? Where, where things like engineering, robotics, computer science and cognitive science um, psychology came together in this in this one thing that was that was robots, and then um, uh, the the Air Force recruited me, and like I moved over to to Colorado and worked with the Air Force Academy in the area of, of human factors. And the the thing that changed is that my robots gotten a little bit bigger. So we looked into things like autonomy. How do we trust automated systems? So very similar to what like Dr. Anton like um, talked about, like what we did is we used first self-driving cars on, on the roads. And then we tried to like expand this into really big flying robots, like looking at autonomous F-16s or like the F-35, F which is, is kind of cool. Just, just very big, not traditionally what we would see as a as a robot, right? And then I moved over to the to the University of Denver, where the idea is that we that we build things that are there for the for the public good. Um, I guess what you need to know about me, I currently live with several robots because I moved them out of my lab during the pandemic, and a cat. None of them is listening to me. Um, I have I have hopes for the robots. Um, they're not they're not playing nicely together. And I try to make them do things for me. Um, well, the robots, and um, I managed to get this, like make this robot get me coffee, but it's a lot of effort doing that just because I have to still make the coffee and then put it on the robot, go somewhere else. And, you know, and then that's the, that is the little Instagram snap you would see from me when, when my robot brings me coffee. So it's still, it's still a lot of effort that goes into that research. Um, 
the research, like the, the robots I've done research with are really cool. A lot of them were in Japan and like now, um, right, it, it changed a little bit here in the US. I've, I've like had this little, it's a, that's a cell phone, right? It's a robot cell phone. It's, it's adorable. Um, the right side, that is a robot. Her name is Ando, right? We used her for a variety of research, a lot in like trust in Android robots that look completely like a human. It was very interesting working, I wanna say with her, right? In, in air quotes, but with that robot. That's another cute Japanese robot, um, like which I run research with, like it's tiny. It's a little bit, it's smaller than a now and it's, um, it is well designed in terms of how it moves. Not quite sure what that is. Found it at an exhibition. I would assume it's a maid, but um, couldn't couldn't really figure out what it's for. These robots are used to to train children um, to like um, to do like turn taking and storytelling. So these robots together tell a story, right? And they show children um, and also children with disabilities um, how to do these these kind of turn taking. Um, when telling a story. That's a squishy robot, so it has tactile sensors in there. So it changes a little bit how you interact with the robot because you can suddenly touch it. And it's it's a very different feel because usually when we run research, we like we really ask you to not touch the robots because they're very expensive. And some of them are just once something breaks, like um, for example, the face of this human-like robot, when that breaks, we, we just, we can't repair it, right? We have to make a completely new one. So tactile interactions with robots are usually not a thing. Here I gave, I gave um, this robot, I gave her another companion robot because I thought she might be lonely. Um, I, I don't know, that's, that's the ideas I like to play with when, when we're looking at robots. Um, this is a great reminder that robots actually can be fun. Right, because I like air hockey. I thought an air hockey robot is awesome. And robots can go to space. So that's the idea of having them as a, as a companion, right? Not necessarily with a, with a function, but just as a companion on your seven month to, to Mars mission to have your own little robot friend with you, right? And us like Japan ran one of the first tests having these companion robots in space. So robots are basically right, one interface for, for one big AI bundle. So the, the AI system is the robot, right? And a lot of things come together in robots, right? So they're basically a mobile manipulation platform that are designed really well, they look cute, and they employ a lot of machine learning, engineering, design, social sciences. And um, I think they also should be able to um, to like incorporate ethics, right? And that might be ethical reasoning in, instilled in the robot um, or other considerations, right? And then that they're being then implemented by the technology. And that is a lot of the things I do when I, when I do research. And the research can look right, very, very standard, like A-B testing, right? We have like several conditions and we see what is going to happen when we bring humans and robots together. Um, we measure things different ways, right? We, we might use a neuroscientific approach, like using FNIRS or EEG, seeing what's happening in the human brain. Where do people look? Or we might use robots to change human behavior. So depending on what the robot does, we influence how the human reacts or what is happening next. So in, in the research I'm doing, right, so we, we like, um, I think that is a nice classification of how robots could be with us in our houses, right? There's a coexistence. So think delivery robot, right? You go your way, that thing goes another way and you know, you're know you just fine. You just, you don't run into each other. There's a cooperation when a robot and you work on the same task together, but not necessarily like in like a, a physical close distance. So think maybe, I don't know, emptying the dishwasher, right? The robot does most of it and you come in later, right? And like put something away where, which hasn't, which hasn't gotten done yet. And then there's collaboration, right? Which is in a close physical distance where a person, a human and a robot work on something 
together, right? And just very, at the same time, very closely. And I think, right, like a lot of the things I wanna do is in the collaboration area, which comes with a whole, whole bunch of problems, right? Um, but it's also, it's also very exciting. And I think we have a huge potential on how to use robots in that area. So a lot of <laughs> something I'm really interested in is like, well, which we're calling now robo ethics or robot ethics is because robots are persuasive. I ran, I ran studies where we made people do things they didn't want to do. They said they don't want to do this. The robot prompted them and then they did. So they are persuasive. They're also really cute, right? Or they can be really cute. And they can also be trusted. And they can be trusted in a way that we overtrust in what they can do. And they can be like under trusted. So we just don't want them to do anything. And both can be a problem. And by it, like as it was mentioned in the in the keynote by, by Dr. Barrage, that robots also have some power, right? So when we can make robots that are persuasive, they have authority, right? They might tell you what to do and you might do it. And this sounds like right now, like when I say this, people are like, no, I would never do what a robot tells me, but we did put it to the test in, in several studies and it is way more subtle than, than just like this, like, oh no, I would never, I would never do what a robot tells me, right? Like narrating this is very obvious in the study, usually like, right, way less obvious. And there is a sometimes very little resistance from, from people to do weird, weird tasks or annoying tasks. And then we have robots just because they are so attractive, right? Because of they can be cute, they can, they can make us do things we don't necessarily want to do, but that can be a very positive thing. So it could be your daily exercise, making sure you drink enough water, like supporting kids, right, with their physical presence in like doing, doing their homework or practicing on a task, right, that is not necessarily enjoying for them all the time. However, right, because they're so persuasive, there's a lot of ethical considerations that should go into account when we have, well, mobile manipulation platforms with cameras hooked up to a Wi-Fi somewhere in the cloud in our houses, like all the time. And then robots come with more than that, right? So when we talk about um, technology, AI, right, they're not free of bias. They're not, they're not right, in, impartial, right? The way we train them, the way we employ machine learning right now, um, there is bias in our data, in our, in our machine learning, and it's a problem, right? So currently the way we train robots, robots are biased. Right? And if you think of like Asimov's laws that robots shouldn't be hurting people, those are science fiction, right? There's, those are not real laws, right? Right now we have, it's, it's an empty space, right? It's a highly discussed space. And I think there is a very big need to discuss this, what's happening in this whole area of robotics that we're looking at right now, right? We're talking, we're talking sex robots, we're talking weaponized robots. Um, talking robots in our houses there's privacy privacy and security concerns and um that's it's a challenge to just talk about these topics um but i think it's highly important that we talk about them now right before we even further down further down that drain um personally i i love like i want i want a robot like baymax um just because it's uh it's big and cuddly, um, but but that's it from me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give it back to to Sarah. Thank you so much, Kirsten. I always love seeing the different ways in which robots have manifest, um, it, it, whether or not research robots or things that we're trying to put into industrial deployment or home deployment. I have so many questions that I'm sure that every, everyone else does too. I see we have one in the um, chat, so be prepared to answer something about the uncanny valley here in a few minutes. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to hear from Mark, who's going to help us walk through another uncanny valley of how it is that we deal with computerized language applications applications. How is it that we deal with training computers, training AI to speak back to us in ways that we understand as being appropriate um, 
and diverse and sufficiently um, ethical. So Mark, take it away. Fantastic. Um, hello, let me just share. I've just got a couple of slides. Um, okay. Perfect. Um, okay, so hi everybody. My name is Mark Diaz. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm a researcher on the ethical AI team at Google. Um, and broadly, this team studies um, issues of uh, bias and fairness um, in machine learning. And in my work in particular, I'm really interested in the data sets that we use to create different kinds of machine learning models. Um, I want to sort of note at, at the start that I come to this very much as a social scientist. Um, I take a the term we use a socio-technical lens to think about issues of fairness and bias. So thinking about the intersections of technological systems and social systems, um, Dr. Barrage poignantly pointed out in her presentation, uh, the fact that we live in a society in which, in which age discrimination is rampant. So it is natural to expect that the designs that we come up with, the data that we collect and the systems that we build are shaped by uh, those biases. And so in my work, I'm really interested in finding the ways where those biases make their way into machine learning models and machine learning data sets. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out uh, to the folks named at the bottom of my slide. They were uh, my research collaborators through the course of um, all of this work. Um, Isaac Johnson, Amanda Lazar, and marie Piper, Darren Grigal, um, also great folks who uh, do related work. Great, so my uh, research is focused on age bias and sentiment analysis. Now, sentiment analysis, it's not something talked about every day, but I'll give a quick overview as to what this is. Um, it refers to, or sentiment analysis refers to any number of techniques that are used to automatically infer emotion or opinion uh, or sentiment in text. And so typically whether some portion of text is positive or negative. And this is really commonly used in sort of marketing scenarios, trying to understand um, how audiences are responding to products or TV shows. Um, but it can also be used in less obvious um, realms like automated financial trading to understand news articles and headlines and how they're talking about different companies uh, to then inform sort of trading decisions. And it's also used as a component of uh, different language modeling applications or more complex um, language or text analyses. You can think about potentially um, online search systems and trying to understand user inputs better so that the resulting um, search results match what folks are actually looking for. Um, now, in my work, I've studied how in sentiment analysis specifically, um, models have consistently or systematically rated content about older age more negatively than similar content about younger age. So in essence, my work involved with uh, something called counterfactual testing, taking sentences that describe a young person, quite literally swapping out a reference of, um, to a young person to that of one of describing an older person and finding that these near identical sentences are being rated quite differently. and. Uh, by a number of different sentiment models. And in my work, I wanted to try to understand, you know, where is this coming from? Why is that? Data, of course, plays some role, but can we sort of unpack that and tease that out a little bit more? And so I started to look at um, data annotation. So data annotation, also not something we talk about every day, is essentially is, is a super important part of uh, training data that's used to um, build machine learning systems. So this slide shows a very kind of basic example of what a training data set might look like. So for sentiment analysis, we might expect uh, a training data set to include a number of different sentences alongside an annotation. And that annotation will indicate whether that sentence is positive or negative. And so you can kind of think about this as a test with the answer sheet. And so uh, a learning algorithm will analyze all of the example sentences alongside all of their associated annotations and try to understand or find patterns between all of the sentences that are in the category negative, for example, and all of those that are in the category positive. And so once a, uh, a learning algorithm has 
detected some kind of pattern, it's then able to look at a new input, so some new brand new sentence out in the world and make a determination about whether that sentence um, is positive or negative. Does it match the sort of group of sentences that are in the negative category or those that are in the positive category? So this sounds fairly straightforward, but um, one thing that's really complicated here is that, and one thing I was really curious about is where are these annotations coming from? Because if we take a closer look at this example sentence um, at the bottom of the training data set, we see this sentence, the young woman's hair began graying earlier than expected. And it's annotated as negative. And this is something we might expect from somebody who uh, obviously doesn't want their hair to become more gray, uh, who may have certain biases against sort of different changes that occur uh, to your body when you get older. Um, but there are also a lot of folks who embrace graying hair. And in my own work, um, uh, I've, I've studied sort of older adult use and of social media, and in particular, a community of older adults that really champions embracing um, positive association, associations with aging, advocating against negative mainstream stereotypes about aging. And someone from that community and many other folks might consider graying hair then a positive thing. So then this question is, who decided this sentence was negative or who decides that this sentence should be positive? Um, that is, what is the, the, the truth that we want to tell or teach the machine learning model? Um, and so coming back to my socio-technical lens, I view data annotations as it's a touch point between human biases and technological systems. And when it comes to sentiment analysis in particular, um, uh, many data annotations are collected through what are called crowd work websites, where folks um, for a small amount of money will complete small tasks, such as annotating whether a sentence is positive or negative. And older adults are not well represented on crowd work websites. And in addition, a lot of, a lot of different sources are used to um, find the example sentences that might be included in a training data set. Um, and in some of my work, a number of models that I was working with sourced their data from Twitter. Twitter also is not, uh, does not well represent older adults. So we've got data not created or written by older adults and not annotated by older adults. And so this kind of raises this concern if we want to use this uh, data or technology for analyses that involve older adults. Uh, we might run into a mismatch. And so in my work, uh, as I mentioned, I'm really focused on this question of who is providing data annotations. In specific, what are the values and biases of those people providing data annotations? And how do we document them? Um, I, I want to sort of take a, a stance or approach that may not be a, one that is commonly heard where bias is typically talked about in a wholly negative light. And I sort of want to caveat that where social bias and social discrimination, of course, uh, emphatically agree, always bad. Um, but whether or not the we want to include certain biases in our data sets uh, depends highly on the applications that we're looking to use these data sets for. So for example, if I am interested in studying the sentiment of a community that happens to hold very ageist views, I might actually want my model to in, uh, encode those views so that I know that I'm actually understanding the views of that community. However, if I want my model to do something totally different and comply with non-discrimination law in automated resume screening, it absolutely should not be using the same data set that I use in my first scenario. And so um, in my work, the sort of like broad arc and, and general takeaway is that I'm interested in figuring out ways we can um, sort of develop best practices around documenting uh, the values and biases in our data sets, um, in particular with a focus on the values and biases of our data annotators so that we can make determinations about whether our data sets are appropriate for um, the goals and, and sort of ends that we're trying to meet. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, 
So I know that there are questions in the audience. I know that some of the other panelists, you guys ha may have questions for each other, but I have the mic. And so I'm gonna tee up a question for each of you um, and we can start there. And hopefully this will not only spark questions um, from you, but also from the audience. So from the top, John, my question to you is you are talking about this next NHTSA study, which is gonna, uh, compare the attitudes of those between 40 and 49 and drivers over age 70. What do you expect to find? Because I was surprised when you said that when people actually interacted with the vehicles, that they came to the conclusion that some of the tech was a bit overrated. Um, what are, are your, what are your hypotheses? What do you expect to be the future to come out of that study? So that's my question for you. My question for Kirsten is, it seems like one of the biggest next horizons in robotics is teaching them how to deal with pressure and teaching them how to recognize texture and to appropriately respond with pressure changes. But that's my understanding from somebody who is pretty remote to the field. What do you view as the next big horizon for teaching robots how they may best interact with the senior population? And then my question to Mark um, is, so let's imagine we had a way to redesign the Mechanical Turk universe and we could do a big annotated data set that was written, ex it, the text is written by seniors and the annotations are written by the seniors. What would you expect from that? So I'm gonna circle back to the top and give you guys some time to think. I didn't wanna spring that on you just fresh there, John, but back to you on that expectations about the NIST, the NHTSA uh, study. Uh, well, thanks for the question. So, um, first of all, yes, some of our participants in the previous study may have found that the technologies were overrated. But I think the, the bigger message I was trying to send is that most really found the technologies to be positive once they were really had a chance to be exposed and to drive vehicles with them. So it was more of a positive message than a negative message. <clears throat> But so I guess I'm expecting some, you know, to see similar results with this much larger NHTSA study, which is currently underway. Um, but I also just wanted to point out that it's not, we're not just looking at attitudes. I didn't have a chance to get in, to even skim into this with the brief time, and I know I went over. But um, we're also looking at you know, driving performance and driver behaviors, and we have full video of the driver as well as all around the vehicle. So we're going to see how people. Of all eight of these two different age groups drive with these systems in the real world. Since you still have the floor, do you have any expectations of what we're going to see in terms of changes in driving performance? Because I think all of us are eager to hear, is this, is, are these AVs, are these automated vehicles going to save us as they've been kind of described? Are they going to save senior drivers from themselves? I, I, I think they have tremendous potential to. And so, so these vehicles are not autonomous, they're not driving themselves, but they have, you know, it's, it's what we refer to as level two automation. So simultaneous, uh, uh, some degree of lateral control by the vehicle, as well as some degree of longitudinal control. So in other words, lane centering plus adaptive cruise control. So when those two things are acting together, we still have a driver slash monitor, but I, I believe my experience in my research says that this can really help to ease the drive, the burden on the driver, especially on longer trips where we tend to see these types of technologies being used. And so if the burden is less, that means not only might it enhance, enhance my safety in, a, in a notable ways that we can talk that are obvious, but it, it might also enhance my mobility because now I can drive longer. I can feel more mm. comfortable driving in other circumstances where I perhaps didn't feel comfortable before. I can you know, decide to take longer trips. And, and, and so it's not just a safety issue, but a mobility issue and a really freeing independence kind of an issue. So I, right. I expect, I expect very positive results is what I'm in summary. I hope you're right. Um, so let me turn this over to Kirsten. So what's the next horizon for making robots, well, senior friendly? Yeah. Um, like, Two things, like tying into John, I have so many questions about the vigilance and like how people actually mess with technology because they know they do. And I'm, I'm like one of the first ones. So coming back to Sarah, right? I've got hurt by robots because I tried to hug them and you know, they like they pinch and like some of them are not really 
well aware of like how squishy humans are. And we're also really reluctant to, to hurt people, right, with, with these kind of techno technologies. So right now those are those are accidents, but we're more and more looking into robots that can do things like administering shots, right? And that is actively hurting a human, right? Like, but it would be something within our, well, pretty much day-to-day -day life, because right, that is that is something like a doctor would be doing. Um, so that, that is a very good point, right? Like the, the robot, like being able to stop in time or right, if, if they touch you, right? If there's any tactile interaction to put on the right pressure, right? And that is a very hard thing to solve from an engineering perspective. And same for the other way around that the robot knows when you touch them, right? So when we're, when we're looking into the overall robot design, like their behaviors and we, we want them to display some some agency, like right, some like self-autonomous behavior, but we also want them to ex like display experience, as in like sometimes there's advantage to make people think that the robots feel right that they um, that they have things like an intention, right? Like maybe for navigation, like the robot wants to go over there, right? So people might get out of the way, right? So like to avoid collisions, or right that the robot wants you to do something and um it works really well when you tap in in our in our cognitive system right there is a this is a study where um like um the robot should be go in a cupboard and right just before people like the participants in the study put that robot into the the cupboard the robot starts to beg and says like no no i'm afraid of the dark don't put me in there and people are like whoa <laughs> I can do this to the robot, right? And there's, it's a machine, right? There's, there's no point for us to think that, um, that, that thing, right? Like that, that pile of plastic that moves, right? Has, has experience, right? They can't feel fear. They can't feel happiness, but we think that. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges we're, we're working with, that our perception of the robot is not what they actually are right so we need to we need to find a way to design robots that we get an idea of what they can do what are their true capabilities like like how is this interaction supposed to look like because we we need these clues right because we we just don't really we don't really know about the robots and that ties into the, the other big thing which is long-term interaction when i said i live with robots they're basically standing around right like you play with them for a little while and then they become very, very much not interesting, right? There is, there is no learning just yet, right? I, I can't ask my robots like, hey, where did I leave my keys? Because they're like, oh, it's like, that, that's on you, human, right? Like, I don't, I don't understand your question, right? There's, there's nothing there. There's no context. We are, we are basically these weird data points that are in their way. Right, so they don't have a mental model. There's no development in that area. So it's it's probably three big things, right? How we perceive robots and how they they should display that um, long term interaction, right? Things like engagement, because we don't want machines that are just like you know, it's like like uh, like Alexa. Okay, nothing happened, right? That they just like this submissive, like yeah, I do anything for you, right? There's there's studies that show when robots start to cheat. Right, or talk back, people are suddenly much more engaged, right? We, we don't want this like submissive thing around us all the time when we're talking social engagement. And um, yeah, so, so- What about like, let, you said something about robots talking back to us and mm -hmm. engaging with us more socially, which to me has a lot about Mark's research, um, particularly when we talk about how robots are gonna speak to and from for example, an elder perspective, because we can make robots infants, we could also make them 75 um, yep. in terms of how they talk to us. So Mark, what what are your expectations of the future? What, How would you make a better speak, elder care um, speaking robot? I think it will be iteratively, right? So right, right now, I think we have, oh, sorry, did I jump in there? No, um, so right now, right, we have, I think we're not there yet that we have this one universal robot. And I think like robots will take on different roles. But right now we have 
robots, at least like for early stages, like um, where we use it for children with autism or elderly with dementia, right? That robots are companions, right? And it, it, it helps people, right? It helps them be calm, it helps them be um, feeling like, right, engaged with something. Um, so that is, that is the early stages. And I think it's gonna move to the next stages where like robots are either like in a supporting role, like helping you do things that you can't do just quite yet anymore, right? So similar to a vacuum robot, just a little bit more sophisticated, right? Like helping you with, with chores and tasks. And then also on the other side, having a social aspect, like an like a interaction, a communication, things like playing games, like, like basic interactions, right? That um, currently like right, human caregivers don't necessarily have the time for, right? Like in, in a nursing home, right? No one will sit, like no, no human caregiver will sit down and play chess with you. So Mark, right, other you, things that, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Let me ask Mark, like how would he design that robot to make, to, to play chess with you to do that? I mean, uh, so much of his research is how to build that positive linguistic experience. Um, so what would you say back on this side, Mark? Yeah, I think a really important aspect, so again, kind of focusing on the language component is thinking about, um, I sort of, my mind first goes to thinking about like chat bots or things like Siri, right? That's We have some experience with it. And so I think it's a helpful place to start. Like folks wanna be able to interact with something that has context that understands like what they're dealing with, what the things that they're asking about, as Chris, uh, Kristen mentioned around, you know, where are my keys? Like, what are keys? Um, what are the possible places it could be? Should I look around physically? Can I suggest places that make sense? Um, but one thing that's really tricky too is um, the sort of personas that we ascribe to robots and chatbots and the potential problems that arise with totally open interaction. You can sort of develop a personality for a chatbot um, and language models are really great for generating um, responses on the fly, but you want to make sure that those responses aren't harmful, um, aren't, you know, encouraging, say, violence or something like that, but that also, um, from a, a social perspective, aren't uh, reinforcing stereotypes, aren't um, sort of taking a, uh, say, patronizing caregiver tone with uh, an older person that they're trying to assist. And those are really subtle things at times to detect in language and really tricky because um, language models increasingly are being developed using data sets so, so massive that it's impossible to know every little thing that's in them. And out of convenience, um, internet data, quite literally scraping the internet and websites uh, is like a great source for language, but um, for anyone that spent a significant amount of time on Twitter or Reddit, um, there's a lot of really nefarious trolling um, and negative content that stands to be learned by the models that we're creating. And so it becomes really tricky then to make decisions around what's in and what's out. And then if it's in the data set, which ideally it wouldn't be, are there ways that we can process the data so that it doesn't overly influence the way in which, say, a robot or a chatbot may interact with somebody? So I think that there's one question that we have in the Q and A that's going to do a uh, going to sort of say something to each of you, um, and that is about the AI explainability question, right? So whether or not we're talking about chatbots explaining why are you displaying this personality, or robots, why didn't you appreciate that I'm a squishy human being, um, or vehicles, why did you? Why did you sort of shake the sharing wheel that I'm on a lane exit or a lane? You know, a lane correct when there's no lane markers there, right? I'm sure we've all experienced that in those construction zones sometimes. So how would you say that the challenges of AI explainability are relevant to your field? What are, what are you thinking about down your domain for, for how to make either cars or robots or language models more explicable? Um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna start back from the bottom with John and then Kirsten and then Mark, um, and we'll go, we'll go around again. Yeah, I mean, that, it's one of the most crucial things is 
trying to make sure that the driver has the correct mental model of how the systems really work and how they are to be used or engaged or interpreted because misuse is one of the, the big things that we're looking at. And so, so, so that I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's one of the key issues is making sure that the, the driver's mental model really matches strongly to the actual way the system is designed. Would you say that's the same thing for you, Kristen, that mental models have some sort of effect here or? Yes. Yeah, right, the, the mental models we create of, of robots currently are not very well known, right? We, we started research in that area and that ties back into things like agency and experience again, right? So like what we think those robots can do, what they experience and like what kind of agency they have and also for us knowing their capabilities. And then that's that's probably the perfect segue to, to Mark, right? Like these machines having that, um, like that self-recognition, what they can do. Because if I ask a robot, it's like, hey, can you can you do this? Can you go over there? Right. So there is a there's a lot of information humans convey in that. And like, first of all, having the robot understand, and then also like you know, being able to know what they can do, that is a very hard problem for, for technology. And you, Mark? Yeah, I, so I think explainability is very much a driver of, of my sort of approach and interest, being able to document um, to the extent that we can and to the best that we can what's in our the data sets that we're using, because there is um, so on the one end, in terms of usability, um, user trust, over trust, and under trust, um, there's a lot of you. So if you go toward over trust, there's a lot of problems. If you go move toward under trusting, there's also a lot of problems. Um, but I'm also really interested in sort of the use, for example, of like gold standard data sets, um, which are data sets that. Um, a lot of resources go into to collect what's considered to be high quality data and use those for typically a, um, a number of different applications. And I think that on the part of developers and researchers, sometimes there's there's over trust in, in what these technologies are doing, like very much a case in point, um, sort of turning the lens back on me and all of my research started studying um, this community of older adults online and the ways they discussed age discrimination, um, aging advocacy. And I thought I would use sentiment analysis to study a, this, a data set that I had created um, from a, a prior study. And fortunately, I spent a lot of time with my one of my collaborators looking at a lot of the outputs and the sentences and the posts we were looking at. And we were sort of thinking, this doesn't seem right. Like some of these outputs don't seem to align with what we expected. Maybe this is just inaccurate. Um, but then we thought, well, hey, why don't we study this a little bit further? Um, we're, lit we're quite literally reading posts about how age discrimination is rampant in society and influencing all these different domains. Why not test <laughs> if that's what's going on here? And that's what we saw. But um, a lot of these tools are publicly available. All of the sentiment models I've studied in my work are publicly available. Um, there's not specific documentation regarding the types of social biases they've been tested for. Um, and for any that might include that, there's no standard way of doing it. So um, I see this documentation as a way of helping provide some explainability to the use cases that are okay, the use cases that are not okay, um, just toward more ethical and responsible use of these different technologies. Great, thank you, Mark. So I'm sure everyone would love, we could do this all day. I could do this all day because we have, you know, large language models, robots and automated vehicles, which is pretty much the trifecta of amazing things in AI. But we are getting to this, uh, to the end of this panel. And so I would like to sincerely thank everyone, Mark, Kirsten and John for joining us this afternoon. And I'd also like to bring Christina Fitzpatrick from AARP back to the stage to give us a few closing um, comments. Thank you very much, Sarah. 
And I want to, um, to join Sarah in thanking our speakers. And of course, I also want to thank Brenda and Sarah for leading these insightful discussions today. I'm really glad that all of you are here to join us as we begin this exploration of how to add aging to AI um, and do build on what has come before. We've heard today about where we are, where we need to go in terms of digital technology and data. Please look for more from AARP and FPF as we pursue this agenda. Thank you very much. So for those of you who are curious what the next step is, um, this is step two of three. If you'd like to hear more about step three, which is something that Mark alluded to um, helpfully in the end of his presentation about the study of public data sets, um, we will be going that direction here in the next step for this FPF AARP collaboration. Um, you'll see up here on this slide, if you'd like to get in touch with any of us that's involved in this project, please feel free to email us. Um, please do find the speakers that have come to you this morning in their various channels, and please find us on, at uh, fpf.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. <laughs>